The chair notes the time is 6.05 p.m. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with the roll call of the ZBA members impaneled for the two items, uh, special permit applications later tonight. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows. Present. Mr. Everett Henry. Here. Mr. Philip White. Present. Mr. David Sloater. Present. The quorum is present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Hilda Greenbaum, alternate member, John Varner, an alternate member, David Offeld, an alternate member as well. Uh, we also have Jonathan Murray um, with KP Law, who's going to do a presentation on solar. And staff, of course, our esteemed staff, Chris Brestrup and Jacinta Williams, are also in attendance tonight. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of the members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Board Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mail to parties at interest. All hearings and members are open and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. They may be viewed via the town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing after which the board will ask questions for clarification or to gather additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board shall seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen or by pressing star nine on their phone. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, please provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where the information about the project and input from the public is gathered followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the application tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for the special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing for the variance to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed with the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there's a 20 day appeal period for an agreed party to contest the decision with the relevant body, judicial body and superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda. Consideration of approval of the minutes from July 25th and August 8th, 2024. And a public meeting where Jonathan Murray from KP Law will discuss the legal aspects of solar permitting and is a training session for ZBA members. We have a public hearing on ZBA FY 2025-03, Amherst Development Associates, LLC, request for a special permit under sections 9.22 non-conforming uses and 3.326 fraternity or sorority building, social dormitory or similar use related to Amherst College, Hampshire College or the University of Massachusetts to alter a pre-existing non-conforming use of a hotel or motel to a social dormitory on the premises located at 345 North Pleasant Street, Map 11C, Parcel 250 in the RG General Residence and Zoning District. This is continued from August 8th. And ZBA FY 2025-01, YG Chestnut, 161 LLC request for a special permit under sections 3.3211 non owner occupied duplex to change the land use cal classification from owner occupied duplex to non owner occupied duplex on the premises of 161 Chestnut Street 
Map 11D, Parcel 66 in the RG, General Residence Zoning District. Following that, we have pu general public discussion on matters not before the board tonight. Other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. <laughs> so the first order of business is consideration of the minutes. Uh, have people had a chance to read over the minutes from the previous meetings? And do we have any um, suggestions, alterations, or amendments to those minutes? I found them satisfactory. In fact, in fact, I found them pretty good. All right. If there are no questions or concerns uh, or no suggestions for amendments, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes from the two meetings of um, August, let me get that right, August 8th and July 25th. Do I have such a motion? So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Been moved and seconded to approve the, the minutes from 20, July 25th and August 8th. Any discussion on that motion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion. I vote aye. Chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Uh, the vote is 5 nothing. The motion is approved. The minutes are approved. Uh, the next order of business is a presentation from Attorney General, Attorney Jonathan Murray. <laughs> I just gave you a promotion there, Mr. Murray. <laughs> um, on that. Yeah. Um, you, I know you have a, a presentation and I think you have a PowerPoint or some something to share with us. Uh, you go ahead and share your screen and uh, what we'll, and we also note that we have three of our alternate members in attendance gathering information for, um, you know, because as well as our, our full members. So, um, Go ahead, and if you wish to share your screen, I think that'd be the way to proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the members for having me tonight and to the town staff for inviting me. Um, I'm here to talk about um, solar permitting, some potential legislative changes, and just uh, some of the case law around it. I know we have you know, maybe about 45 minutes for this, so I will move at a deliberate pace, but if at any time you want to answer a question, please just interrupt me. It's your time. I want to make it useful for you. And so I appreciate you having me. Um, I also will preface by saying I have two screens. So if you see me looking off in this direction, I'm just looking at a second screen. So I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention to y'all. Uh, let me see if I can do this correctly. And uh, can you all see that? Um, yes. Perfect, thanks. So, um, Again, John, uh, my name is Jonathan Murray. I'm from KP Law. I know I've been in front of um, the board before, and I've been in front of the solar bylaw working group. So you might have seen me in that context, but um, I assist the town in zoning matters. Um, and so I'm here to talk about solar zoning, legislative considerations, and just kind of some generals do, do's and don'ts when it comes to solar. Um, I will preface by giving the required disclaimer that this is general information, that uh, if you have specific questions or a specific application before you, you know, consult with either me or another attorney in our office. Uh, everything kind of, as you know, with these types of applications, particular facts are, are, are very important. So, you know, this is good general information, but if anything specific, let us know and we can help you walk it through it. So uh, I'll start briefly with the statutory uh, background behind solar zoning, or I should say the solar exemption. So as you all probably know, 40A3 contains many of the statewide exemptions for uses under zoning. Um, you might hear them referred to as the Dover Amendment. While not technically correct, you might hear 40A3 referred to as the Dover Amendment. Uh, the Dover Amendment really refers to the uh, educational and religious uses, but those are two of the uses that are referred to in, in three. There are other uses in three, such as childcare facilities, um, as uh, uh, handicap ramps uh, associated with residents. Most recently in the past couple of weeks, we have as of right accessory dwelling units, which I'm sure I might be, be back in front of you all or a different board to give an update on that. But um, as it pertains to solar, this is what 40A3 paragraph 9 says, no zoning ordinance or bylaw shall prohibit or unreasonably regulate the installation of solar energy systems 
or the building of structures that facilitate the collection of solar energy, except where necessary to protect the public health, safety, or welfare. So that's kind of our starting point um, for the regulation of solar in the Commonwealth. And again, it's presumed that the legislative goal is uh, that there is a legislative goal of promoting solar energy in the Commonwealth. I just say that because um, um, not a lot of case law on that, but it's presumed that that this is a sufficient legislative uh, goal. Uh, so just something to keep in mind. But so that language shall not prohibit or unreasonably regulate. I think it's important to kind of compare and contrast 40A3 and compare and con contrast solar with other uses. Um, so, for example, paragraph two says no zoning ordinance or bylaw shall regulate or restrict the use of land or structures for religious purpose or for educational purposes. Um, so you simply can't regulate educational or religious uses except for, you know, some some minor bulk or dimensional um, requirements. That's not the same as solar. So so cities and towns and permitting boards like your own have a little bit more discretion when we're regulating solar uses. Uh, the statute says you can't unreasonably regulate. Um, so it's important to know that there's kind of different tiers onto you know, what these exemptions are and the scope of authority of the town to regulate them. But uh, solar in particular is not as strict as, say, religious or education. Makes sense, I suppose. Um, uh, just just as an example, because it's kind of the, the news of the day, the new accessory dwelling unit uh, statute, which comes into effect February 2nd, that statute says, uh, towns may not prohibit, unreasonably regulate, or require a special permit for ADUs. So they kind of go with the trifecta of legislative exemption language. Uh, that's not the same. And I'll just flip back one side so you can see it again. Uh, the, the provision in 40A3 says no zoning ordinance or bylaw shall prohibit or unreasonably regulate. Um, and so there is still some room for towns to reasonably regulate. Um, I'm going to be talking a uh, probably a lot about this case, Tracer Lane. It came out in 2022. Um, it's kind of the the key case in the past couple of years, um, analyzing 40A3 paragraph nine and what cities and towns can and can't do. Uh, but you know, to connect the last two slides, it provides municipalities uh, with more flexibility than the statutory protection for those other uses: education, religion, and childcare. Uh, which only allow for reasonable regulations on bulk and height. So um, again, that's just talking about the level of scrutiny or the level of exemption afforded to solar. Uh, so that's Tracer Lane. And so any any questions so far? I'm going to talk a, a few minutes about Tracer Lane and what that case was and its impact, but any any questions on the exemption itself? Seeing none. Um, so I'll, if, if you do, just please interrupt me. It's, uh, you know, welcome any questions. But so so Tracer Lane versus City of Waltham, it came out in 2022. Uh, it's probably the key solar case that we have from the SJC. There's been some trial court cases, Lane Court and Superior Court after this case, which um, rely heavily upon it. And I'll say the Attorney General's office, not that this is uh, particularly applicable to Amherst anymore, but the Attorney General's office, when reviewing solar bylaws, relies heavily on this case. So uh, it's pretty important. Um, but the SJC held that where uh, whether a bylaw facially violates the Section 3 prohibition against unreasonable regulation is whether the bylaw restricts rather than promotes the legislative goal of pro promoting solar energy in the Commonwealth. And so for those who might have seen my presentation I, I probably a year or more at this point to the, the solar bylaw working group, we talked a lot about um, the goal and intent of a solar bylaw. The goal and intent of a solar bylaw needs to be, at least according to the SJC and Tracer Lane, promoting the legislative goal of, um, or should I say, the, uh, you know, promotes the legislative goal of promoting solar energy. It can't be restricted. With that said, so long as the, the, purpose of the bylaw is to promote solar energy, you are allowed reasonable restrictions um, in, in other as aspects. 
So we'll get to that in a minute. But I think it's important um, to keep that duality, if you will, in mind. You know, does the bylaw promote rather than restrict solar? Uh, and that's the first analysis point for trial courts and appellate courts in Massachusetts to determine whether the bylaw uh, violates 40A3 or is in conformity. So a little bit about the facts of Tracer Lane. Um, the develop, developer actually was seeking to get to construct solar in the abutting town of Lexington, but they needed an access road through Waltham and Waltham, um, that parcel in Waltham was a residential district. And in Waltham at the time, um, you could not have solar in a residential district. So they denied um, the request to use the access road to access the site in Lexington. Um, Waltham excluded large scale solar from most all of its um, zoning districts. And uh, I know that we see in all but one or 2%. I think there's a specific uh, percentage in the case uh, later on, but you know we'll just call it 2% of the town uh, for, the, for the sake of discussion. Um, and so using that numerical uh, value, that quantitative value of 2%. The court said that Waltham's bylaw was, uh, un, the bylaw unreasonably restricted solar energy. They took the, the, the position that if you prohibit solar in 98% of your town, the land area, land area of your town, and only allow it in this small 2%, it is facially on its face, unreasonable, and therefore violates 48.3. Now, I will say, as the years have progressed since Tracer, I don't I don't know if there's such a, a strong emphasis on that numerical analysis. I think you could have a, a percentage of prohibited land versus allowable land that, um, you know, based on a bunch of different factors could be permissible. But I, I think it's important to note that we our starting point in 2022 has been this 98 versus 2 percent. And so that's something important to keep in mind um, just when we're adopting zoning bylaws is if you prohibit it in most of your town, a court might see that as unreasonable. Um, and so speaking more to the legislative intent of 48 of three, the solar provisions of 48 three, the, the SJC, the highest court in Massachusetts, said large scale systems like the ones proposed in Tracer Lane um, that are not ancillary to any residential or commercial use are key to promoting solar energy in the Commonwealth. I, I point that out to, um, to raise the point that there was a thought kind of before Tracer Lane that 40A3, the intent behind 40A3, was not to allow these large scale systems. It was to allow for, you know, some panels on your roof or panels, you know, that were accessory to your residential structure. The thought being that um, in the 1970s, when this was first adopted by the legislature, there wasn't uh, as high a frequency of large scale systems as we see today. You know, it was rooftop solar was the was the primary use of solar at the time, at least that's my understanding. Um, and so I think it's important to clarify, the, the court clarified here in Tracer Lane, no, no, it, what, it's not just those, those solar panels on your roof that 40A3 protects. It also protects these large scale systems uh, because the, the, the presumed goal is prom promoting solar energy across the Commonwealth uh, to, to solve that or to address the energy crisis. Um, so again, uh, I, I know I said it kind of in the beginning of the Tracer Lane conversation, but the court explained that whether a bylaw facially violates Section 3 is whether or not uh, the bylaw promotes rather than restricts this legislative goal. And so when we're talking about prohibitions or restrictions, those expand not only to those rooftop, uh, you know, residential rooftop panels, but also to these large scale systems. Um, so we're going to have more categories of solar use. I've I've permitted now large scale, small scale, on the roof, over parking lots. Um, I was just driving through uh, Amherst, the UMass campus the other day, which 
I, I think some of you know that I attended UMass and I noticed that they put up those roof, those, uh, those uh, parking lot solar panels over some of the parking lots. And I said, oh, that's new. I hadn't been there in a while. So, you know, uh, I'm sure as the decades go on, there's going to be all these new categories of types of solar um, facilities or, or fixtures or, you know, equipment. So something to keep in mind, again, they, they put a lot of emphasis on, does it promote rather than restrict? May I ask a question? Oh, yes, please. So um, I, I haven't read this case, and, and I will, but did the court um, emphasize a balance and act in, as to where um, these solar panels can go to be considered not restrictive? Did it talk about location in the decision or did it just essentially say, if you restrict 90%, only allow 2%, then it's facially, you know, flawed? Yeah, so so very good question. Yeah, so the case doesn't specifically address the locations within town um, that you can or cannot prohibit it. It made the, the initial determination, which it thought was sufficient, that that a 98% re restriction in town was facially, you know, a, a violation of the statute. What we have seen since then, though, is some trial court cases, which I'll talk about in a minute, and then some attorney general decisions, which I, I, I cite a few in this slide, but I have a list of about two dozen, if you'd like them, um, where we talk about, you know, where in town can we restrict them? So, there is there is some latitude on the town to restrict, say, like in a single family residence district. Those have been, you know, passed by the attorney general to say that that's probably OK. Um, there's also I don't think I've seen a restriction in an industrial or business district, but I'm sure if there was a compelling local reason connected to a public health, safety or welfare welfare you know basis um, that you could also make that argument. So. I don't think Tracer Lane talks about the location in town. It just talks about the percentage. But we've started to see cases since then, especially through the attorney general. And then there's two trial court cases that I've seen recently in the past two years that talk about um, towns may, um, may restrict the location in town so long as the bylaw on its face is promoting rather than restricting. So, so long as you're making steps to promote you know, generally in town, you do have some authority to restrict, um, you know, reasonably. Um, does that answer the question? It does. Thank you. Slover has a question. Yes, I have a, a more general basic question. You've referred a few times to a, a bylaw of what it can and cannot include. Is the ZBA involved in actually formulating a bylaw or are we when when you refer to uh to things that can go into a bylaw don't yeah. aren't we charged with interpreting a bylaw that already exists we're are we formulating and pa and trying to pass a bylaw on this committee uh no miss miss breastrup can give a more of Fulsome answer on that. Um, yes, hi. Uh, there's a solar. There was a solar bylaw working group that um, developed a draft solar bylaw, and that bylaw is now being reviewed by the um, CRC, the Community Resources Committee, and that bylaw will also be reviewed by um, certain staff members, and then it will be sent out to boards and committees for comment. Um, so the Zoning Board of Appeals may have an opportunity to comment on the draft, but other than that, the Zoning Board is not involved in making um, zoning bylaws. I think what Mr. Murray is trying to do is to give you background so that when a solar installation comes before you, you have a sense of the kinds of things you can regulate and the kinds of things that you shouldn't regulate. Okay, thank you. Um, Attorney Murray, I have another question. Yeah, sure. I, I, I cannot see hands, so I want to make sure I'm not jumping okay. already. Hmm? You're go ahead. Okay. So, um, 
people putting solar panels on their houses, um, I would argue, promote solar panels. Is, mm -hmm. is that factored in this decision as the town promoting solar panels? Or do they mean something different than just people putting solar panels on their houses? Um, so this case was specifically talking about large scale ground mounted solar and their city ordinance, their zoning ordinance prohibited large scale ground mounted solar in 98% of the town, the city. Uh, and so they said, the, the, the SJC said, that that was an unreasonable prohibition because uh, if I go back to uh, 782 here, this first bullet, large scale systems not ancillary to any residential or commercial use are key to promoting solar energy in the Commonwealth. So I, I think it was, it wasn't so much about rooftop solar, but it was the acknowledgement, acknowledgement by the court that these large scale ground mounted systems are included in the exemption, the intent of the exemption in 40A3, um, and they're the they're the type of use to also be promoted. It really, I you know, I don't I don't know. I'm sure there is a case. I, I'm not familiar with a case off the top of my head that talks about rooftop solar, because I think those are just generally there, there's not a lot of opposition to those. What you do see opposition to most of the time are these large scale ground mounted systems. So the and that's where you get based on large scale thank you yeah. so we really don't get any we don't quote unquote don't get any credit for permitting rooftops um it's really we're making it we have to our decision has to facilitate ground-based large-scale arrays is that right so when well, I, I right and they're balancing but they're, we're not going to get credit for the rooftop Solars. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would I would preface by saying that your decision needs to be based on whatever the, the new bylaw says. And then in light of uh, the state law that provides this exemption. So it's kind of uh, two two pieces. So I wouldn't say that you're you're required to based off of 40A3 uh, alone to 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 promote something in particular, you have to consider each application based off of the bylaw. I guess I had was about whether it's pr promoting or not. And it sounds like if the bylaw, it, it sounds like the bylaw has to the bylaw can't wouldn't be sustained or upheld if it said we're going to restrict large arrays someplace because we do so much to allow uh, rooftops it sounds uh, like that isn't, that's not the, the balancing act for determining whether you're promoting it or not is that right yes yes okay, yeah, that, no i agree that, that's what i meant to, the question i meant to ask yes. sorry okay all right no thank um, you sorry for misunderstanding and Mr. Varner, and then Ms. Brestrup. I had a question about um, <clears throat> whether or not there are Massachusetts communities that mandate solar installation over things like new parking lots and commercial buildings. I know that's the case in California. Uh, they're even mandating it on residential construction after a certain date. Uh, and what legal impediments would we encounter mandating something like that for Amherst in order to expand our uh, percentage of solar coverage? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I know that folks are exploring that possibility. I'm not familiar with a bylaw that's been passed and approved yet. I think more what we see rather than requiring is encouraging. So you might give density bonuses or some sort of other, um, you know, development bonus for those that meet um, you know, have additional solar or maybe that are, are, um, uh, what is that lead certified, LED certified, um, or meet some of the other requirements. Um, you might run into legal issues with requiring certain, um, 
installations, but it's going to depend on what the bylaw says and what the requirements are. And so I don't know exactly what the town's bylaw will say after, you know, the committee and the town council and planning board, you know, everyone has a chance to look at it. But um, I would say what I see more these days is provisions that promote uh, solar by giving some sort of uh, development bonus or an incentive or, you know, allow for, you know, greater height or greater setbacks or something like that. So all carrots and no sticks. For the most part, I'm sure I'm sure there's someone out there that has a stick. I'm I'm, I'm trying to think think. I, I don't recall one off the top of my head, but um certainly could look into it. Thanks. Ms. Presto. Thank you. So I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um in Amherst, we don't have a solar bylaw yet, but that doesn't mean that solar installations are not regulated. They're regulated as energy generating facilities and they need a special permit in any zoning district. So that's the way they're currently regulated. And I think we've approved five of them so far under that um, umbrella. So that's one thing. Um, large scale solar, I've learned from Jonathan Murray a few years ago um, is basically defined as a 250 kilowatts, which is about an acre. Is that right, Jonathan? Mr. Murray? <laughs> yeah, you can call me Jonathan. It's fine. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's yeah, 250 or, or 25 megawatts of nameplate capacity. Yeah. Yeah. And that takes up about an acre. So anything that size or bigger is considered a large scale solar. Um, another thing I wanted to say is that Amherst has a stretch code. So um, the stretch code encourages um, any kind of energy saving or, you know, production of energy on a property. So we, we have that feature. We also have a net zero requirement for municipal buildings. So with the exception of the library, any municipal building that is built or changed in town, um, built really, is uh, required to have net zero. So the new school um, has uh, solar panels in its parking lot. The new school will have solar panels in its parking lot. So, so it is kind of mandated for municipal buildings. And I guess that's all I wanted to say. So I wanted to just touch on those three subjects. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, so, so I've talked a lot about what a bylaw can and can include, and as as Chris helped me out there, uh, the the reason for that is so that when you do when when this board or uh, yeah when this board is reviewing your bylaws and 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 interpreting them, you know the basis for you know the statutory exemption and the case law, and you kind of have a background of well, this is why it is the way it is, and now we go into how do we apply it. Um, I'd like to talk about special permits. There was a fear at the time that Tracer Lane stood for the proposition that you can't impose a special permit requirement. We now know that that's not true. Uh, PLH versus Ware was an appeals court case um, that said you could impose a special permit requirement on large scale installations. It's a legitimate municipal purpose, um, but the court cautioned that said you can't use a special permit requirement as a guise or as a as a you know a back end to prohibit solar in town, um, and that the way you apply these special permit requirements is consistent with your bylaw or ordinance, um, and that the that the regulations can required for the the issuance of the special permit are connected to a legitimate uh, public health, safety, or welfare reason. Um, so this is a PLH versus Ware case. I can I, I am familiar with this case because I happened to write the trial court decision when I was at the land court. That was all the way back in 2018. So this one kicked around for a long time. Um, but the appeals court found that that it was an appropriate use of municipal po municipal power to require a special permit. Um, but I just raised this case to you also uh, just for for the thought of special permits can't be used as a as a means to prohibit all solar. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't instances where it is appropriate for the board to deny a special permit, but keep that standard in mind is that it can't just be used to deny 
this use, which has a, a special protection. Um, so that's again what PLH said, quoting Tracer, um, uh, and the land court upheld the denial of the special permit for a, for the solar energy system. Um, and then I think there was a there were there, there definitely was a question a minute ago about locations and, um, you know, are we are we are you coming up with a bylaw? Are we just interpreting it? I, I think this case Sunpin Energy uh, is helpful or informative to that point. So this was a case where the bylaw required a solar special permit and the board in support of its denial and in, in, in relying on its bylaw gave these reasons, adverse effect, impacts on natural and working lands, placement in a residential area, negative impacts on property values, um, require a significant cutting of trees, and um, it would adversely affect habitat for wildlife, recreational opportunities, and a sense of place for people. Um, and so not to say that all of these reasons are reasons that this board could use, but in um, I say this just to say that when you're looking at a special permit application or any sort of proposal, going back to your bylaw to see what are the purposes of this bylaw and what are the, the interests that it protects um, are important, especially where, where there's a denial and there needs to be a rationale for that denial. Um, so there was a, a case where the court upheld the denial because the board cited specific reasons, reasons were supported in their bylaw, and those reasons were supported to, uh, were uh, based in public health, safety, and welfare reasons. Um, you know, impacts on land, impacts on, you know, the trees, uh, uh, environment, those are all based in public health, safety, and welfare. Um, again, you all don't particularly need to analyze this. This is probably more, this was a carryover slide from the solar bylaw working group, but just in case you're interested or you want to see what other towns are doing, here's some four examples. Um, and we have probably a list of two dozen at this point since 2022. Um, happy to provide those or happy to provide the link to the AG's website where you can search for these by category. Um, but just maybe if you want to read through a couple of these descriptions, um, they're informative on kind of what other towns are doing. Um, so, and, and then I'll conclude, uh, how am I doing on time? I'm doing not You're terrible fine. on time. You're doing well. Um, so there was, when the, when Chris first contacted me a few months ago, part of the request for this talk was potential legislative amendments regarding the local permitting of solar. And I will say that I'm sure you read it in the news that the legislature kind of ended its session and there was a lot of these bills that important bills that didn't get addressed. And this was one of them. Um, but just to back up on why there was a bill and um, what the bill said, uh, Governor Healy established a commission on energy infrastructure siting and permitting. Um, and in March of this year, this commission put out a report, which is available on the state website. I'm also happy to forward it to you. Um, their recommendation was larger energy projects um, be under the, the jurisdiction of the Energy Facility Siting Board, and smaller projects remain under, under the jurisdiction of the town. Uh, the threshold between large and small is that 25 megawatts of nameplate capacity. Um, to be honest, I don't know uh, from an engineering standpoint what that means, but from my permitting aspect, uh, you know, it's generally for the most part usually put on about an acre. Um, I think they can do it sometimes smaller, sometimes bigger, depending on site features, but that's my understanding. But um, that was put in the bill. That was the threshold between small and large. Um, the act specifically was Senate Bill 2838. It was passed by the Senate on June 25th. It was passed by the House with amendments on July 17th, and then referred to conference committee the next day. Um, but no formal action was taken before the formal legislative session ended. Um, so it's not passed, it's not law, uh, but it is something maybe to keep in mind is that there may be, um, should the legislature decide, uh, this change in procedure whereby larger systems bypass the town and go directly to the state and smaller systems 
um, go through the town. Um, let me just see here. Yeah, so, so these are some of the recommendations that got incorporated into the bill. So it would mandate a consolidated permitting process at the, at the local level uh, and give cities or towns 12 months to issue a final permit decision that contains all necessary local approvals within one consolidated permit. So I know my colleague, I think Carolyn Murray is meeting with you all next week on a potential 40B. It, it, it might be helpful to think of this proposal like a, a solar 40B, if you will, that um, it would require one hearing by one board and um, it would require, you know, all the permits to be encompassed in that one public hearing and the permit would have to be issued within 12 months. Um, as it pertains to large scale systems, the bill would propose reforms to the Energy Facility Siting Board that would expand its membership to include municipal representatives, um, and then their consolidated perming process would have to occur within 15 months. Um, so I'll repeat that none of this is actually law, and we don't really know if the legislature is going to take that back up, but um, I figured I'd throw it out there just so you know kind of what the discussions are at the state level and know that there might be a possibility sometime in the future that you guys might not even need to consider special permits or any other zoning relief for large scale systems. Um, those might go to the state, but small scale systems, uh, we might need to come up with either bylaw amendments or policies and procedures or something to effectuate this proposal of a consolidated permitting process. Um, but as last I checked, nothing has occurred. I know a few bills have gone through since um, July 30, 31st, but I have not seen any movement on this one. So um, I think that's kind of it for the moment. I also wanted to just talk about any questions you might have when you're considering a application for solar. So if there's any specific questions you have about that or, or anything you want to know about solar, just happy to talk about it. I would just, if you have any questions about uh, a about this topic in general please make sure you phrase those topics about uh, in, in uh, phrase those questions in a way that did not specifically reference the special permit that we have before us so you can talk about it generally but less but if i want to avoid speaking about the special permit application we have for a solar array currently before the board Yes, and I, I'll just I'll just let you all know. I don't know what that special permit is. I haven't looked at it. Don't take anything I've said as you know, you know, speaking as to that application. I don't know what that is. So uh, again, I go back to I suppose my disclaimer was important this time around. Yeah, um, it, it was good. Yep, uh, Mr. Allfeld. Yeah. Do you um, uh, you you've spoken a lot about solar panels. <laughs> Does the 40A3 include solar storage? I'm thinking of battery systems, um, solar, yeah. such as the site that was proposed up in Wendell. You may be familiar yeah, it's really with, in any case, large scale battery Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really interesting question. We're still kind of working through that. Um, I think the general consensus at the moment is that if a battery energy solar or I'm sorry, a battery energy storage system is connected to solar or support solar, the battery storage is also entitled to the 40A3 exemption. The gray area, what we've what we've now learned is that there is apparently some economic feasibility to just having battery systems that are connected to the grid, um, not connected with solar. And um, I, I might be off base, but my understanding is that they pull energy from the grid during certain times of the day and then they release it back out and there's some sort of economic, um, you know, you know, viability to that business model. So I think the general consensus is that towns have more authority to regulate and restrict those types of non solar associated battery systems, but when they're connected to solar, they're entitled to the exemption as well. Mm -hmm. That's not my problem. Uh, if I That's could my, go on with another, 
<laughs> if I go to another question, Mr. Chair. Um, Absolutely. Yes. So the proposed law, which has not did not pass in the in the latest latest session, mm -hmm. for smaller systems below the twenty five megawatt threshold would still go through town bodies. Did the law specify which town body? I mean, it, you said it might be like a forty B, which yeah. is a, as I understand it, is a ZBA thing. Would it, would it necessarily go through the ZBA under that law? Yeah, so it, it, I don't know if it would necessarily um, it would necessarily go through the ZBA. I think one version of the bill I saw said the chief executive officer of the town um, would be the permitting authority, and then I think there were amendments to say you know entities designated by a bylaw or ordinance. So it's unclear which version might get passed if if it gets passed at all. Um, sure. But it could be the case that the law specifies the board, or it could be the case that each city and town gets to choose. We're not quite sure yet. Okay, thank you. Mr. Meadows. I have uh, what I think will be one clarification for you. Um, 25 megawatts of solar usually will take about five acres, not one acre. Okay. That's helpful. Yeah. Uh, the other, uh, you a couple of slides prior to this, you had a an example of cutting a lot of, a lot of trees. Could you yeah. go into that example a little bit further, please? Yeah. So my understanding is that the bylaw in that case made a point of saying that the cutting of trees and vegetations, uh, it was a purpose of the bylaw because the cutting of trees and vegetations has an impact on public health. Um, and so that bylaw made a point of pointing out that the cutting of trees um, uh, um, would affect public health and would affect public uh, welfare. I'll just go back to that uh, because they made reference to, I want to say correctly, uh, because maintaining, and so this is one, two, three, four, four or five lines down, uh, cutting a significant number of trees because maintaining trees assists the Commonwealth's energy policy goals because of in, of the important water management, cooling, and climbing benefits trees provide. So that was the rationale given by the board in denying the special permit. Um, that was also a purpose set out in their bylaw. And um, in my opinion, that was affirmed by the court as reasonable because all of those reasons, you know, the uh, the protect uh, the maintaining of trees to assist in energy policy and cooling and climate um, and you know general environmental concerns are based in public health safety and welfare which is the statutory requirement to reasonably reasonably regulate solar energy systems thank you Are there other questions, comments? Mr. Allfeld. Uh, this may be, well, I think this question is sort of a legal definition question. So on that SunPin Energy Services paragraph you have up currently, the third line says, uh, quote, adverse impacts on natural and working lands. What uh, what would be, what does adverse mean in this context? I mean, uh, you're gonna have some impact, presumably if you're gonna develop a piece of land. So what does adverse mean? And perhaps yeah, it's too I, general I a question, but. Well, I think it's a general question, but it's a good question. I mean, um, I think to your point that any sort of development is going to have impact on lands. What is adverse? I think what courts are going to require is one, is there a definition or is there an explanation in your zoning bylaw? And then two, when a permitting board is reviewing that, we have to have the rationale for adverse. So if there isn't um, a specific definition, you would have to put a, the permitting board, whether it's this board or any other board, would have to put in the reasons why it is adverse. So um, I, I'm going to come up with a ridiculous example so as not to confuse with any, <laughs> you know, things. But you know, say say a solar, you know, say a solar proposed solar facility would um, would 
I don't know, pollute all the trees in the in the the surrounding forest because of a particular type of device they were going to use. The board might say, well, well, that's adverse because here here's the thing. We had our expert go out. This type of device isn't used all the time. It's it's only proposed for this type. And um, it's going to have this adverse effect. It's going to kill the trees. It's going to pollute the water. It's going to do X, Y, Z. Um, so I think that maybe it's a good question. It's general, so I can't answer it specifically, but I think it goes to kind of what this board's directive is, is, you know, when making these factual findings, you know, if if it were to find some adverse effect, it's really important to put it in your decision why the board found it was adverse. And the more you can support that with, you know, specific examples or expert reports or, you know, the rationale, the more likely that a, a reviewing court might uphold that as a reasonable restriction on solar. Thank you. So I, so I just so I better understand what from, from Mr. Offeld's question. So it, the, the, the court hasn't held that aside from religious and educational institutions that solar large scale solar siting is more important or takes uh, takes precedent more important than other health welfare and safety concerns such as pollution of groundwater per se it doesn't say that one is higher than the other we're still left with the duty of trying to bat as a town to, uh, to to construct its bylaw and us to interpret it that we're supposed to balance out the pursuit and the promotion of large scale solar and the other kinds of things that we have to do to protect health, safety, welfare, et cetera. Is that correct? I think I would frame it to say that the 40A3 says towns can't prohibit solar or unreasonably regulate solar. Yeah. When it wants to reasonably regulate solar, it must be based it must be based in a public health, safety, or welfare reason. So, so Tracer Lane was important because it prohibited in 98%. And the court said, well, that's a straight out prohibition. You can't, you can't prohibit it in almost all of the town. But if we go back to say uh, PLH versus where, PLH versus where said, no, you, you know, it, it might be a reasonable regulation to impose a special permit requirement so that a reviewing board can ensure that those public health, safety, and welfare reasons, those, you know, components of your bylaw are met. But you can't use the special permit just as a preface, preface for saying, no, we, we don't want it. It's more of that due diligence, making sure that, you know, all of those public health, safety, and welfare reasons stated in your bylaw, those requirements are met. Um, at the same time, there are instances where you might say this, this is going to hurt public health, safety, and welfare based off of our bylaw. And that's where you come back to Sunpin. Um, so I, I don't know if I would frame it necessarily as you framed it, where we're, you know, we're weighing the the promotion versus the restriction. I mean, that's certainly true when we're coming up with the bylaw, but when we're applying the bylaw, we would say you can't prohibit them and you can't unreasonably regulate them, but you can reasonably regulate them based on public health, safety, and welfare reasons. And that might necessarily mean that in some unique circumstances based off of certain factual you know, elements that a proposal might be denied. But you can't use, you can't use, you can't just have a blanket denial policy. I think I did okay on time. I'm hoping it's six fifty nine. Well, you know, it's not all. It's not all within your control. <laughs> Mr. Meadows has a question, and I was just going to oh, congratulate you on getting it done one minute early, but. Well, I'm sorry. It's going to cost you that, but it's. I, I'm <laughs> terribly right. sorry. Yeah, that's all right. But obviously, I'm confused. Yeah. There. Does Sunpin then, the Sunpin decision, then maintain that it is more important 
to maintain trees assisting the Commonwealth's energy policy goals because of the important water management, cooling, and climate benefits of trees, as opposed to the solar benefits of... It, there's a contradiction here, and I, mm -hmm. I, I would like to know um, if there is something more of a precedent in addition to Sunpin in this decision. I would say that no, the court in Sunpin didn't make a definitive, this factor is more important than this factor. Trees are more important than solar. That's not what, what what's occurring. It would, would generally occur in a reviewing court. What the reviewing court has to do is look at a board's decision to see if it is you know, whimsical, capricious, unreasonable, based off of the interpretation and application of a zoning bylaw. So when looking at, say, the bylaw in Sunpin, for example, the court has to look at what does the bylaw say? What is the purpose of the bylaw? What does it protect? And then was the board's decision sufficiently supported and based in the, the, the requirements and pur purposes of the solar bylaw? And then, you know, you know, was it reasonable in light of the 40A3 exemption? So it's going to be unique. And I know this is probably not a great, you know, helpful answer, but it's going to be unique town by town, project by project, uh, and, and how the board applies. Um, so there's no, there's no bright line standard of this factor is more important this, than this factor. It has to be, you start your journey at the exemption in 40A3, you continue to what your bylaw says, and then you apply your bylaw to the facts in the specific application, and then you, the board, may weigh the facts of that particular proposal. And then that, that, that interpretation and application needs to be sufficiently supported by the bylaw and by the exemption. Um, and then it's up to the court to say, was that decision reasonable? I know it's not helpful to say like, you know, it would be easy to say, oh, well, cutting of trees is more important than solar. But that's just not how the courts, the courts give you some amount of deference. Um, but, but yeah, there's, there's no, this is more important, X is more important than Y. I wish I could say that your answer was helpful, but <laughs> I think I, I, will, I, I, won't, take, I won't take it personally. <laughs> I'm sure it is not your responsibility, no. Thank you, though. Ms. Brestrup. I just wanted to make this suggestion that if you do um, need to review a large-scale solar installation that is being proposed, that you could ask um, the town manager if Mr. Murray or someone from KP Law could, you know, follow that case with you, you know, come to public hearings with you to advise you as you're going along, or at least review a decision before it's final, um, so that your conditions and your findings make sense, mm -hmm. and, you know, have a good chance of standing up to an appeal, either from people who are against a project mm -hmm. or people who are promoting it. So that's always something that is available to you. Thank you. Is, is, is that something we could ask for at this point? That is something um, I could ask the town manager if he would authorize that. Yes. If that's a, if you are asking me to do that. Mr. Chair. I think we're going to need some help on the special permits we have before us with this um, information we got today i think it'd be very helpful okay i will ask I the town manager is, and this is it, not something that we can impose the cost of which we cannot impose upon the petitioner right this is not like 40b this is something that we the town pays for there's some question about that but um i certainly don't have a clear answer on on the answer yeah okay. all right yeah talk to the town manager about that because i think mm -hmm. we could use some guidance thank you great 
Well, Mr. Murray, um, you still did a great job keeping it right on time uh, on a complicated topic. And since we started five minutes late, you did it within an hour. So thank you very much. I, I appreciate you all having me and the time. And um, I, if you guys have questions, feel free to, you know, send them through the planning uh, department. And um, I'm happy if the town manager authorizes it to to help or you know, someone else in my office to help with any of specific questions on specific applications. So just let us know. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you share the presentation? I have to read those cases. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, do you guys have co a copy of the PowerPoint? I think it was included or sent to you. I think we had, yeah. Sent via email. Okay. I'm not sure if it was included in the packet, just sent it would know that. But we can sure get it to you, Mr. Henry, I'm sure. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you all. Good night. night. Thank you. I just wanna note for the record that uh, Building Commissioner Mr. Mora has also joined the call or the Zoom. The next order of business is um, ZBA, a continuation of the University Lodge um, hearing, ZBA FY 2025-03, Amherst Development Associates, requesting a special permit under sections 9.22 and 3.326 to uh, alter a pre-existing non-conforming use to a social dormitory on the premises located at 345 North Pleasant Street, map 11C parcel 250 in the RG General Residence Zoning District. This was continued from two weeks ago on August 8th. Um, and since that time, I know we had, we had questions that we had for the applicant. We got some information back. Um, and the one thing I do not have and perhaps Jacinta, you can send it to me, is an updated project application report. I've had some trouble, Jacinta and I were trying to work this through earlier today. I've had some trouble on some of the documents and I think it's based on my computer, um, not your fault, but can you, do we have an updated project application report? And if so, can you send it to me? Sure, hold on just one second. Great. But since that time we've got, since that last meeting, we have a updated lease agreement um, we have an updated site plan with um, identifies parking spaces as well as identifies two locations for um, for uh, rubbish bins. Um, we have I know we have cut sheets for lights. That's one of the things that I could not pull up, but I know that it came in. And we have um, we have a document that we sent to um, Mr. Reedy and Attorney Reedy and his client on possible conditions uh, for of approval and requests that we had made. It's, if I hit everything, Jacinta, or is there anything else that I've missed in terms of uh, new submissions since anything. our last meeting? You haven't missed anything, and um, we actually haven't updated the PAR. Um, okay. Just because uh, of the timing. Of the reception of the document. So if you'd like us to do that, we can, but we can also do it live as well. Okay, well, I'll operate. I have the old PAR, um, so I, I can operate off. Yeah, the I can operate off that. Excuse me. Right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I was impaneled for the discussion on August 8th as a uh, an associate member. Yes. I, uh, I see that there is a full panel tonight. I don't understand. I don't know if. I am to participate in this uh, discussion and then I'm out of it for the rest of the evening's discussion or if the full panel is um, here and I am not part of the discussion tonight. I, you know, that, that is a really good question. I think what I have listed is Mr. Judge, Mr. Sloboda, Mr. White, Mr. Henry, and Mr. Meadows, but you were at, you did, you did go to the, the University Lodge Site visit? Did, are you participated? I went to the site visit, and I also uh, participated in the August eighth or uh, Zoom exactly. meeting. And Mr. Mr. White, were you not at that one? Correct. So if you do want to stay on. You do want to be on that panel. And uh, thank you for catching that. Yes. So Mr. Varner, stay with us. Thank you, Mr. Right. Chair. 
Yeah. Uh, just to avoid any maybe confusion on this, I'm going to obviously stay on the call because I'm on the next uh, thing, but I'm going to turn off my video, like I said, just to avoid any confusion with things. Great. Thank you, Mr. White. Thank you. Good. Uh, Mr. Reedy, do you have a um, presentation for us? I do. And just give us your name and address for the record. Of just course. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson in Amherst. Here on behalf of the applicant, uh, 6 Southeast Street is the office address. Um, and as Mr. Chair noted, we were here two weeks ago. We got a list of items that uh, we uh, were requested to take care of. We we believe we did that. I'll go through them. You know, high level, there was questions about the lighting. And so we provided a cut sheet that I'll show you. Uh, questions about trash enclosure location and screening, which I'll also show you uh, modifications to the lease, which we'll talk about, uh, dimensions of studios and one bedrooms, which we'll talk about, and then really updated site plan to capture dimensions of parking spaces, make sure that uh, ADA spaces exist with sufficient uh, striping adjacent to them, and then some additional site features. So I'll probably work in reverse order um, and I'll start with the site plan updated just to walk you through. Okay. So if you can see my screen at this point, uh, what we've done is just updated the site plan uh, to show the parking spaces in addition to, and I'll zoom in just a bit, the uh, size of them. So they're 18 feet long and then they're nine feet wide you'll see that the ADA spaces, both marked one here, one here, have additional width, same length, but then also here is the five feet, and then we've got the eight foot for the, the van accessibility here. We've also updated the site plan to show the lighting under the porch. Uh, that was one of the requests uh, of the board. We've also got you know, um, transformer pad, a water line, birches, grass, the uh, uh, parking area delineation, setbacks, electrical meters, again, uh, lights underneath, the wall light, which I'll talk about a little bit more in detail. I should go back to here and note that you've got a utility pole here that's going to have a, uh, this is an Eversource pole. So one of the questions last time was about the poles. These are both this one and the one over here are Eversource owned poles. Uh, we're told by the electrician that the lights on them are dark sky compliant, but but those are Eversource poles. So we have no control over the fixtures that exist on, on those poles. Um, we've also got, again, grass, vegetation shown, trees, size, uh, species, and location, utility lines, uh, stormwater infrastructure. None of that's changing, but just really we, what we wanted to do was update the plans to show you know, again, you know, planters and a little bit more specificity. So if you're able to approve this this evening, you can approve it uh, conditioned on this being the appropriate plan. And so this is this is the site plan. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions if you want on this. Um, maybe I'll just talk about the two tra potential trash enclosure locations. There was a separate exhibit that we provided, no great shakes. Uh, what we did was highlighted this area right here, if you can follow my mouse, and another area up here uh, as potential trash enclosure locations. I'll show you in a moment the potential trash enclosure screening so you get a sense of it. It really is just like a white vinyl. It'll be tall enough to screen the the trash, the, the dumpsters that are there. The one that we provided you was like, it showed four feet by four feet. What we'd actually provide as a condition of approval would in fact screen uh, those dumpsters, but at least we wanted to provide what we expect it to look like. So I don't know if there are, I can always come back to it, obviously, if there are any questions now on this site plan, I'm happy to pause and- respond. Real quickly, all the parking spaces are nine, aside from the ADA are nine feet wide. Yeah, some may be a little bit, uh, nine feet wide. Yes, yeah, some may be a little bit wider, like down here, this one looks like- but They're all at least nine feet. Yes. Okay. Okay, I'll stop that share and just, I will move along. I will show exterior cut sheet of the, this is the light that's proposed for that that wall. Uh, if you recall on the northerly side of the 
North Pleasant Street side of the building, there was a somewhat antiquated light. This is a dark sky compliant light that um, the applicant is proposing. And so you've got this in your packet as well. As you see, dark sky. I will show the dumpster enclosure. And again, this is this is what we'd be looking for for the dumpster enclosure. Like I had said, you know, this one I think measures four by four. We'd be looking to have something that actually, you know, if the dumpster's tall enough, if it's six feet tall, we'll obviously screen it and appropriate width as well to make sure that it's it's screened. And then I don't know that I need to share anything else, but what I'll talk about is um the lease modifications and the dimensions of the units. So Kurt actually went out there and measured the studios. They're 280 square feet each. And then the one bedrooms are double studios, essentially. So 560 square feet. Um, we've updated the lease and I sent a red line in and you can see the changes. What, what we did was we updated the guest policy so that there's no more than one overnight guests in studios and no more than two overnight guests in each of the one in two bedrooms. Uh, there's no more than a three night stay for any overnight guest. Uh, the parking policy was updated to reflect what we had talked about, which is one space per unit. And then there's a limitation on the number of occupants. Uh, a, a, a maximum say for families, which again, we had this discussion last time. I don't want to uh, run afoul of the law if families can't exceed that amount. Uh, but for, for unrelated, let's say no more than two in a studio and one bedroom and no more than three in a two bedroom. So there's one two bedroom on site. We would allow up to three there for the studios and the ones no more than two except in any case, if it's a family and if that's allowed. And I, frankly, I just, like I said, I don't know um, the, the law on that one. And so that I think are, those are the items that were outstanding uh, that we needed to provide and we've provided them. So we're happy to answer any questions that you have. So the one question I have is, I mean, I, I appreciate the, the response uh, to our questions, Mr. Reedy, and I know you don't have the, the, this, um, a site, uh, a floor plan, but I have to take your word that those are accurate. I mean, it seems about right, so I, I'm sure that that's an accurate square footage. Um, I, the quick question I have for Mr. Mora is, so if you've got, is there, is, does the state sanitary code limit the number of people in a 280 square foot um, dwelling unit to three, or is it two? And can a fam is is there an exception for a family? I know we kind of talked about this last week, but the only thing I'm thinking about is would would a mother, father, and two children be allowed in a studio apartment of 280 square feet? So the the code answer to that question is the the number of occupants is two for that that amount of square feet. Yeah, number two. Okay, so your your lease may be. My understanding, if that's correct, then your lease may be um, contemplating a situation that you can't do, right? So yeah, and that's and that's fine. If that if yeah. that's what I mean, we're not we're trying so to. You're not going to you're not going to violate the sanitary code, right? Right. right. Okay. Precisely. Yeah, we're just trying to stay. We're not trying to violate anything. Right. I know. I know what you. But I just want to make clear that. <laughs> No, that that's, and that that's fine. Does not permit, does not allow four people to live in a in a 280 square foot. And if if the board would like, I mean, we're happy to update the lease to reflect that. I think the language I might have added was a parenthetical about families, just so we yeah. weren't running a follow of law. But yeah. if we want to say something about, you know, no more than two individuals in, you know, this in this studio, uh, as per sanitary code, to give the you know land like some cover. That's absolutely no problem. Okay. All right, Mr. Sloboda. Well, my my question or point it goes to that as well. 
and I have a note here, it's number four R, which is what we're already talking about. Your parenthetical says uh, uh, for a family, as the term is defined by local, state, and federal laws, and in Amherst, it's my understanding that four unrelated people can constitute a family. So I think there is the potential for an unnecessary complication here for students who want to reduce their individual cost of monthly monthly residential cost could claim to be a family like they do in all sorts of student housing. So if if as Mr. Morris said you can't have more than two people here anyway, I think it might be wise to just take the family exemption out of this clause altogether. And then if it's simply limited to two, since I don't care if anybody's related or not, if it's just going to be two, then leave it at that. I That was my only note. I appreciate the changes you made on the lease that I brought up last time about cars per unit and all that. And I think you've done a very nice job. And I, I want you to know that I recognize that. But uh, the family, the definition of family in Amherst always makes me a little uneasy. And that's why I went right to this one when, believe it or not, I actually read your lease again. So uh, my, that's, my suggestion is that any, any reference to family comes out, especially after what Mr. Morris said. Yeah, a great suggestion. And I don't think there's any issue with that. Again, we were trying to uh just prevent any discriminatory uh suggestions about prohibition of family so right i think but, so but you also don't, don't want to run afoul of mr mora uh, well no now that i've heard what mr mora says right so none no of us do. Of him. yeah no we'll, so we'll we'll make that update thank you yeah so you we'll, we'll remove beginning with accept and ending yep. with prevention and begin yep. jay with the with no no correct Correct. <laughs> no, yes. No, yes. Yes. All right. Are there other comments, questions regarding the proposal? I guess the one thing that I would would ask um, is conditions that we had contemplated. And I have a revised possible conditions list from 81424. And Jacinta, is that the most recent? Oh, you're, it's pretty hard to hear you, Jacinta. Can you turn up your volume? Or maybe Chris, you've had your hand up. I wanted to ask a different question, so. Um... Okay, so let's, Ms. Williams can tell us the, uh, can, is this the most recent possible conditions list? Yes, it is. Okay, I think that's a yes. All right, um, Ms. Presta. I just had a question about the screening for the trash. Um, you showed a panel or two panels uh, that would screen the trash bin. Um, how is that going to be configured? Is it going to be like a three-sided um, structure? And does it have a gate on it? Or is it just open? Um, these things can get to look pretty ratty after a while. So I wondered if you could describe a little more about how that's going to be set up and how you're going to maintain it. Yeah, it, it's a good question. And I think Ultimately, what we'd like to do is, you know, let's assume that there's an approval this evening. Potentially, I would suggest before a certificate of occupancy is issued, we provide the inspection services department with the actual specifications of what we're going to be providing, because there's obviously going to, depending upon which side we put the trash and the, the dumpster on, it may open a different way, but I would suspect that there will be some gates that would need to open for access. And then the question would be, again, depending upon location, is is it all enclosed or is one side open? And so that's why I think just as a practical matter, once we know where, I think we can better say what, um, and then we can just provide that. But the intention would be uh, white vinyl uh, screening of the, the dumpsters, I would assume, with a gate that could open. Thank you. 
Any other questions? All right, if there's no qu other questions from the board, um, as per um, normal process, we can open it up for public comment from the public. If there's any anybody in the public who wishes to comment on this matter, uh, so indicate by raising your hand um, using in Zoom or using star nine on your phone. I don't see anybody indicating they wish to speak. All right, there's no, no public comments, no further comments from the board or from the participants. I would entertain a motion that we move into a public hearing, a public meeting while keeping the public hearing open in order to deliberate on this matter. Do I have such a motion? Chair, Judge. Yes, Ms. Uh, Ms. Williams. Interrupt, you had four public comments submitted either via email or by letter. Did you want to acknowledge those? Um, we had four public comments on this matter. Um, sorry, no, you did not. I'm yep. it's yep. 161 chestnuts. Yep. Sorry. On, the, on the next matter. Yeah. I'm ahead of you. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, that's, that, I'm glad you are ahead of me, Ms. Williams. Thank you. But um, thank you anyway. Um, so moved. Is there, is there a second? So and we need a second. Second. Prior seconds. So we have it's moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? No discussion. The vote occurs. Mr. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Slobiter? Aye. Mr. Varner? Uh, you're, you're muted, Mr. Varner. Aye. aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Uh, mo motion's carried five to nothing. Uh, we're in the, into the public meeting portion. Um, my inclination is that this, they've answered the questions we had um, about the project. This project is going to, I think, improve the neighborhood. It's going to be improvement over the, the, the uh, previous use. And um, I think with the protections of the conditions that we've discussed and the changes they've made, this is a, a, an application that ought to be approved. I, I'm looking for other people's proposals, the general sense of the board before we move on to conditions. Oh, well, go ahead, Mr. Sloater. Well, if you're looking for comments, I agree with the chair. I think they have sufficiently answered our concerns. I think that I also had a note about the trash enclosure because the the panels that they uh, that Mr. Reedy showed w don't move the something. It it can't both hide the trash and uh, not move because a big truck has to come in and do something to it at some point. So I'm going to trust that they will do an appropriate job or Mr. Morrow won't let them get away with it. So we have to, at some point, trust somebody. But I think that they have sufficiently answered the our concerns and that this project properly done will actually be an improvement over the existing conditions. So I also think that this one warrants approval. Great. And unless anybody feels otherwise, what I would like to do next is to move to con consideration of conditions. And I think the best way to do that is for Ms. Williams, can you put the um, most recent possible conditions for approval on the screen so everybody can look at it, make sure we're all operating off the same document. Can you see those? I can. All right, this, you're, the conditions are pretty small there and it, I don't think it's just my eyes. No, I'm gonna enlarge it. There we go. And, and what's the date on this one? I, I have got, a- um, so I'm operating off something that's also dated 814, but will this, if there's any difference, I will um, I'll try to, I'll, I'll try to I'll mesh them in. But let's operate off this because this is what we have that's before us. So the first condition, and I'm gonna go through these. If anybody has an objection to one of these conditions, state it and we'll, we'll deal with it separately. But my intention would be to go through these um, and, uh, and consider them all in block 
uh, aside from ones that people may have a, a specific concern with. So the first one is it has to be managed in accordance with the proposed management plan as approved by the board on the appropriate date. The same thing with the parking plan dated. What's the date on the parking plan that you've submitted? It's dated yesterday, is it not? Just really, I think we'll, we'll get the right date, but it's a parking plan. It's the plan that you submitted um, actually for the prior, the, the prior um, meeting. So we'll get the right parking plan that this, this one so the one that was submitted is august 19th 2024. got it okay any significant changes to the lease shall be submitted for review and approval by the board at a public meeting any changes to the existing conditions plan for landscaping or exterior lighting shall be submitted for review and approval by the board at a public meeting all move in and move out shall occur during the hours of eight to seven and shall be coordinated through the leasing office to, to lessen impacts of multiple moving trucks blocking Parking or the fire lanes, all snow plow in the parking area should be promptly removed from the site. Um, all trash pickups, delivery, construction, maintenance, machinery, and landscaping equipment shall be conducted during the hours of eight to seven. Exemptions shall include emergency vehicle snow removal or other emergency situations as approved by the building commissioner. The waste receptacle placement shall be in one of the two locations shown in the site plan. Final placement location and approved by the building commissioner prior to issuance of the building permit. The board shall be the board may consider uh, mr chair just one thing yep. there and, and maybe this is for mr moore building permit um i don't know that another i don't know that we need a building permit for the trash enclosure and i believe a building permit's always been already been issued for the building so maybe issuance of a certificate of occupancy would be more appropriate there yeah i think that's right mr. So moore. I, th I think what i think with that condition is asking for is um, confirmation on where is it going to go and what is it going to look like uh, by the issuance of the building permit. And I just, I, I think there's already a building permit issued for the building to, for the lot, for the lodge rehab. I don't, this is more technical than in the weeds. I don't know that we're going to seek another building permit. You, yeah, they'll need to be because the, the, the permit is limited to a scope of work that doesn't include the change of use, uh, okay. doesn't include the installation of the kitchens. You know, it was a uh, partial permit to start with some of the cosmetic upgrades and, and system upgrades for the lodge as a lodge. That was, you know, an opportunity that the that the uh, the owner took to get started a little sooner. Okay. Uh, not that, knowing that not knowing the outcome of this hearing. Yeah. And I would just. That's I would suggest the second sentence be replaced with details of the enclosure, uh, you know, six foot high vinyl enclosure, uh, you know, in accordance with the detail, you know, provided something like that. All right, or did... Ms. Williams, we're, we're having a really hard time hearing you, at least I am hearing you. Can you increase your volume? Um, I've increased it significantly. Oh, that's better just, right now. That's better now. I think I just have to project chair judge. So that's <laughs> what I will do. All right, thank you. You're welcome. In accordance with the, uh, well, I think you just referenced the, the um, cut the, the sheets that they provided to us earlier. Okay. All right, and then I think the comments about uh, discussion and dumpster screening can be taken out when you finish that. Yep. I, I would just ask, use, use the word enclosure and minimum six feet high in there. Uh, because the detail is not that at all. The detail is really just for the the material. All right. And, and the look. So we have to have something in here that the final details of um, an enclosure that is at least that is at least six feet high, right? You could just add those words and fill it in later. Yeah, I, would just, yep. I will come up with the language later. Add it at the end, six yep. six feet high enclosure. Yep, and we can come up with final. That. Yep. The, 
the project shall comply and be managed in accordance with all terms of the management plan and the altered approved. This is standard stuff. Uh, the applicant shall log and maintain all complaints filed with the property owner. This is standard stuff as well. This is what we do with rental properties consistently. Um, so we go on down to the next one. Let's go down to 11. That's again standard. This is the annual review during the rental registration and submission of information. The role of the on site manager is defined by the zoning bylaw, shall be assigned to an occupant of the premise at all times. We talked Mr. about Judge, just a, a moment on that one. Uh, and Jacinta, I don't know if you, uh, Ms. Williams, I don't know if you could bring uh, Mr. Shumway in. I think we just wanted to talk about the imposition of this condition and maybe not imposing it um, because of the, the management and 24 you know, 7 call service that I think Kurt could probably talk a little bit about. I'm bringing him in now. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay. Um, Mr. Shumway. I, what I would like, I, I guess it's if you have somebody on, you've got um, 21 units or, or 17 units, I guess it is on site. If you have one person that's kind of assigned for the immediate, um, handling of any problems before they have to go to the 24 hour um, call system that you have for your, your, um, your tenants. I'm wondering what the, the difficulty for you is to have somebody getting a, a, a slight break to be the initial, the initial first call for certain kinds of problems. Just so, so let us know what your thoughts are on that. Hi, uh, good evening. Uh, that was a question to me. Yeah. This is Kurt. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, it's 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 not necessarily um i can kind of talk to you a couple challenges but it's not necessarily that it's a, a a huge deal other than you're you might have turnover there and you try to you we're re-educating people all the time as uh, for this type of thing um i i think i'd like to fall back on sort of our reputation as managers we're, you know i've got uh, many, many properties, some 18 units and more right downtown Amherst. We've got the 45 unit building down the University Drive South uh, with no on-site management. And we, we we manage very, very closely and carefully. And I and I think our reputation is such that uh, it's 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 really just unnecessary. Um, it, it's uh, it's not a financial thing. It's just a, a another uh, I would say requirement. And if I have turnover, I've got to sit with somebody and, and discuss with them what, what I expect of them and all that. So it's, it's, you know, if I felt that we had a lot of problems and, and we would, the, the, the rare occasion we might have somebody that might help somebody with lockouts, yeah. something like that. Um, there, there does become other issues when you have quote unquote onsite managers. Um, if you get into some bad situations, um, it's not necessarily a healthy thing for that individual either. Uh, don't, I, I don't like to put people in those positions when it's really our job to do that. So I, I would prefer not to be expected to have a manager. And, and um, I guess our reputation, Rob and anybody else, once again, you can, you can fall. I, I just fall back on our reputation. We just manage closely enough that I don't feel like I need to have somebody there. Thank you, Mr. Shumway. Uh, Mr. Moore, it, but for this condition, would they be required to have an on-site resident manager? No, they wouldn't. Um, I'd also say the the resident manager, if you look at the definition, you know, it really fits better for the smaller properties, and I think that's what it was designed for. Um, you know, we we often see it in two-family dwellings, converted dwellings. And, you know, the individual assigned those duties, you know, serves a purpose in that uh, type of a building. But when you look at the definition about coordinating the maintenance, housekeeping, administrative duties for the rental units under their charge, it really doesn't fit when you have a, a established uh, property management company and firm right down the road uh, that Mr. Shumway has. So, uh, you know, I would just add that for your consideration. Thank you. Mr. Sloviter, was this your was this your suggested commission um, condition or not? I don't remember um, exactly. I, mean, I don't think so. Neither do no. I I don't think so. This is not a big sticking point for me. 
Me either. Okay. Anybody else have a concern about that? All right. Let's, Ms. Williams, let's remove that condition. <clears throat> so we're removing no. I mean, condition 11? Number 12. 12. Thank you. Number 13 is a, the new number 12 is parking management plan shall be followed at all times. Any changes have to come to the Zoning Board of Appeal at a public meeting. Park controlling occur on marked spaces. Vehicles parked on site without authorization from the owner or outside marked spaces shall be towed. All exterior lighting shall be designed and installed to be shielded or downcast to avoid light trespass on adjacent properties. Lighting fixtures shall be selected according to the dark sky compliance recommendations of DBA rules and regulations. Property shall be maintained free of litter and debris. Occupancy of the dwelling should be predominantly by matriculated students enrolled in the University of Massachusetts. Amherst or Hampshire and the family members and resident manager uh, will have to, we can uh, amend to take the resident manager out in support of family members to the extent allowed by law. Occupancy shall be limited to maximum as permitted by Man uh, Massachusetts State Sanitary Code as follows. So two is the first X two is the second X and three is the third X, correct? Mr. Reedy, two for the first X. That is correct. Second two, X two, three. And three, all right. Greetings shall, uh, gatherings, not greetings, gatherings shall be limited in accordance with the terms of the lease agreement, no party shall be permitted on site without the approval of the owners and prior notification to inspection services. Excuse me, can oh. we go back to number 17 and yeah. put, I think it's two. For a one bedroom unit, isn't that correct? Yeah, two, yeah, it's two, two, two three. for a one bed, one bedroom. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And and while we've paused, maybe go back one more to, to 16. Um, with the, uh, yeah, just, just to talk about because I, I thought we heard during the last hearing that there wasn't a requirement of having matriculated students there. And so, I think I just Kurt probably as well would like to explore this a little bit more, and and maybe it's a question for Rob about does this use category work require it? Is this language okay? Could I guess what does predominantly mean? And um, you know what I guess what's the expectation? Because I think Kurt would you know like to be able to provide housing, kind of end stop. Um, if it if it must be written this way, it must be written this way. If if it can be a little bit more lax or eliminated, I think we'd appreciate that. So just looking for some guidance here. So those are question that I had um, was, is there a requirement that only people that are enrolled be allowed to live there? And if that is the case, then what happens if that person is no longer um, enrolled in school? Do they get evicted? Do they have to leave? Um, and I also have concerns on their part if that happens through no fault of their own, now they're in a break lease situation where they're losing security deposit and first and last rent. Yeah. So yeah, the, those are questions and concerns that I also had as well. I think Mr. Mora spoke to that last week, if I remember right, about one that the, you wouldn't expect that if if somebody ended um, their school mid lease that they would we would expect they would be allowed to complete their lease, the term of their lease. I think that's what you said. Um, but I don't remember what you said regarding the, whether this, we needed to have the um, condition of dwell, uh, predominantly matriculated students. So can you go back over those things, Rob, and talk to us about it? Yes. Um, so in my opinion, it's not required. You know, this condition does not have to be written this way. It is a uh, condition that has been used in uh, planning board site plan approvals for larger uh, developments of this type. But I do think you need to, you know, have some kind of language or condition in there that sets this building apart or expectations apart from a, an apartment building. Uh, because otherwise that would be the use classification that this this building would be permitted by, and it may or may not be able to be done for, for one reason or the other. So, you know, whether it's, you know, 50% or 20% or whatever, you know, we don't have to come up with a number, but 
you know, we don't know what predominantly means anyway. You know, if we can come up with another word that we don't know what it means, uh, we can try to apply it. But I think the the intent here is that the building is available for uh, students of, uh, of those uh, colleges and the university, uh, but it doesn't mean it has to be every occupant. But predominantly just means, it means mostly, it doesn't mean 100%. And that's kind of, so it gives some flexibility. I don't know what other word you would use. You know, um, you would put a, well, I, don't know how, I don't know how else you maintain the student character of this building, which I think we need, we should be doing, um, giving them a little bit of flexibility for situations that occur without holding them to no more, you know, no less than 75% or predominantly seems to be a, a term that that's plain meaning is, you know, more than, more than, more than half and not necessarily all is what predominantly to me means. And that seems to me to be the plain meaning. I, I don't think that's something that you're going to, you're not going to be going over there, Rob, and saying, well, I think predominantly is 75% and you have only 60% students. I, th I think it's. Um, no, I'm, I'm not troubled by the condition or the language, uh, you know, and, and sure we'll figure it out if we needed to. But Mr. Mr. Henry had a, another question about what happens when, if there should be a change in the student's status during the term of his lease. Is that right? That was another question that you had, Mr. Henry. Is that correct? I, I did. And again, it, it goes back to what controls here, the lease or the student status, because that seems to be um, if, if this project is intent on having students live there with a condition that they're looking at number 16, that they're students. Um, if they're no longer students, then and I know Mr. Moore said, you know, we're not going to evict people, but, um, and that's comforting that, you know, that's not going to be strictly enforced, but does the landlord get deference to say, you're no longer students, you have to leave? Um, that's, that's part of the concern here is. Uh, may, may I comment? This is Kurt. Yes. Hi. Um, to, to that, I think we talked about last time specifically that I, I would not, um, it's not reasonable, fair, or, or, or any of that to try if someone leaves school willingly, willingly or unwillingly during a lease, we, we would, we would allow them to run out their lease, assuming you all agree with this, we would allow them to run out their lease. And, um, it's very likely it's possible that they would just move out on their own. But to the language, I would suggest something that we would uh, we would attempt to predominantly have students, and um, you know that's our, our our good faith effort. I I think it's really hard as we're discussing that if something happens midstream of a lease, I don't think anybody expects someone to be uh, evicted, and th that would be uh, that just wouldn't be the right thing to do. I don't think anybody here is expecting that based on the conversation I'm hearing. So if we were to say that we, we make an effort to be predominantly student and if we kind of get to 49 percent because one of these, you know, individuals become uh, becomes a non-student, then we make an effort to make it over 50 percent the next rent roll, something like that. I just don't I, I'm not sure how important this actually is. So if we make a best effort. It seems to me that might be satisfactory to everybody here. You know, I think language like to the greatest extent possible, predominantly students would be fine with me. That would solve that problem. But your yeah. question is whether yeah. the lease, isn't it really whether the lease requires them to be students? And I don't think it does. The lease, is uh, that? My, 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 we, we manage our properties per property. I have properties that I won't allow students. Um, and so it's very rare that I have a lease that sp is specific to a property. Actually, I don't have, uh, I don't have that unless it's talking about whether you've got including utilities, we, we make those modifications there, but this would be the only lease that we actually have that is specific to the property. It's generally more our efforts and just saying, no, you, you know, 
we do or don't allow students. Um, but you, you know, I think I think we're all in agreement. You, we can create whatever yeah. language we want, and we'll we'll. Uh, yeah. You got to be fair to the people who are there, unless they're you know what I was going to say. If they're real troublemakers, we all know that we have a hard time evicting those folks anyhow. Mr. Henry. So, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm I'm not comfortable with the language in number sixteen for two reasons. Um, and, and I'm using the history of sitting on this panel. We have had applications come before this board where people have tried to convert, and because there's a concern that students are going to rent into these neighborhoods, they were denied. I will only support this if number sixteen, in no uncertain terms, says this property must be occupied by students. We have time and again do not deny petitions because students may move there. This is close to UMass. This is this is away from neighborhoods. The the application was geared as the property was meant to be for students. So unless it actually has specific language to say must be occupied by students. And I appreciate that the lease will take precedent over anything else and that's comforting, but there cannot be any room to say best efforts or we'll give preference to students first and then somebody else. It has to be student-based. So you're opposed to the word, use of the word predominantly. Yes, the and word, the word, is, the word and shall. And what happens, but what happens if this person loses their status as a student during the course of the year? Well, we heard and Mr. Shumway says that the lease will prevail. Lease prevails. Yeah. So, so then we do have, then we do have a conflict between the condition and the, and the, and the lease. Um, and that's why it predominantly was there, I think. I don't necessarily think we do. Um, it's e even if the person um, is no longer enrolled as a student, when they started this lease, they were a student. And, and I'm comfortable with that. But to say best efforts and then it gets rented to, um, quite frankly, the majority is non-students. Um, it goes against what the original intent of this application was, was to create student housing. Okay. Uh, Mr. Meadows? I agree with Mr. Henry. Mr. Sloboder? Uh, wait, am I muted? No. Okay. Um, well, there are a couple of things at play here that I think conflict a little bit. Mr. Morris said that the classification for this property is aimed at student housing, basically, that it falls under a, a student organization. I think Mr. Henry's concern about people dropping out of school in the, during their lease and potentially being evicted is a good point. We don't want people can drop out for all sorts of reasons. And Mr. Shumway said he would the lease would prevail. I think that predominantly could actually be defined in a non-punitive way as 75% or something like that, that Mr. Judge referred to. It strikes me as very unlikely that out of 21 units in the building, that over the course of the year, more than 25% of those units are going to drop out of school. The purpose is to be in school and find a, a decent place to live. So it it could be that you need to be a student in order to move into the place, in order to sign a lease, that at the beginning of the lease, you have to be a student at one of the colleges, and then you can secure the residence because you're a student. And if you leave during the school year, it's not, you know, it will not pose a problem. You can't, you won't be evicted just because you're no longer matriculated. But if this is supposed to provide student housing, we could just make it a requirement that you need to be a student to obtain the lease in the first place. 
and then the lease would prevail if people drop out. I I I would bet that it would be predominantly students throughout the year. People aren't people don't leave school that easily. So it it could be that it would address Mr. Mara and Mr. Henry if you needed to be a student to secure a, a residence in this property at the beginning of the lease. I think that may be an elegant way to resolve our differences or resolve the concerns that were expressed. I don't know if they're great differences. Mr. Henry, is that satisfactory to you? It is, but looking at the language, shall needs to be changed to must. Isn't it the same? The, the what, word, what's the difference? I the mean, word, you're a lawyer. I, 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 yeah. it, 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 it has different meanings. Um, and Mr. Um, <laughs> um, so it's to Mrs. Slover's point, um, it, it makes sense. Yes, the when you police, you must be a student. And if Mr. Shumway um, is standing by his lease saying, okay, I'm a student, um, we're still going to honor the lease. That is, um, that is acceptable. But again, going back to my initial point, the major concern here is that this is meant to be student housing and it needs to be student housing. Okay, so let's let me read through this language and then I'd like to move on because I think we've reached a consensus here. Lease agreements must only be made with the matriculated students enrolled at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, Amherst College or Hampshire College and their family members and his or her, okay, we got too much there and their family members and delete, yeah. All right, to the extent allowed by law. I don't know that we need that. All right. In the event that a student no longer maintains their enrollment, the lease agreement will be honored for the full duration of the agreed upon rental term. Good enough? I think it's simple you're, you're, point. yeah. Craig's got a problem. Oh, you're you're um you're muted, Craig. I don't care for the and their family members. Well, the only one I can think of is if you you have one student who's married living in the, the studio with his spouse or his partner, his or her partner, or a graduate student with a child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they all in any case they can't have more than two. In the studio, they can't have more than two in the one bedroom, and they can't have more than three in the two bedroom. But that's always the limit by the sanitary code. So you can't have four people living in a studio or one or two bed or even the two bedroom. I I think it's okay to leave in family member as long as one of the people is a matriculated student. If 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 the lease signer is a matriculated student and has a family member live with them, then it is that should be permissible. It's a, it's still student housing, crowded student housing, but it's student housing. So we're not going to get we're not going to get four people into a, into one of the studios. It's not that's not going to happen by using the term their friend, their family. There's still a limit on absolute number of people. Is that does that deal with your concern, Mr. Meadows? Yes. Okay. All right. So I think we have 16 locked down. All right. 17 occupancy limits shall be read. We talked about that already. Um, gathering shall be limited in accordance with terms of lease agreements, but the approval of the owners and prior notice. Uh, or notification to inspection services. You have to have notification to inspection services for a for a gathering. That seems oh I think that says parties. No parties shall be permitted on the site without the or, or and inspection services. All right. Let's remove the the red. Okay, thank you. 
I mean, Mr. Mr. Chair, just for if we're getting into words, <laughs> I guess party is a broad spectrum. Um, and I, I don't know that I've seen this condition elsewhere. I might not have been paying attention elsewhere, but it just concerns me because I guess I don't know that there, if, if you put parties of greater than X or gatherings, because we have gatherings and gatherings under the lease says no more, I think, than three per. And so if it's, if it's more than that, is that a party? I just don't. Well, we, isn't that the purpose of the requirement is that anything more than the lease is a party? If that's the, and maybe I just didn't, I see a little bit behind just in the screen. Okay, so larger than a gathering. Yeah, I think that's fine then. I just didn't read far enough. That's my fault. All right. So let's get back. Parking shall be limited to building lot occupants and their guests. All right. EV charging stations may be involved with minor necessary adjustments to parking count due to the regulations of the size of the loading zone. Um, that's fine. Applicants shall remove the existing University Lodge sign certificates up, and the applicant shall return to ZBA for approval of any future sign. Accessible parking spaces. We've been through this. The minimum number is. Um, two based on 26 and those things can be taken out. All right. Are there any other conditions that people wish to add? That board members wish to add. I, I just have a question, not at a sign. Do they need to come back for number 21? Can this not be approved outside of the ZBA? It's a sign. That no, I think we have to, I think that we're, we're supposed to at a public meeting approve a sign. That typically is what happens with, um, for businesses and other instances. Now, now, we could leave it up to the building commissioner to approve the sign, but typically if they want to put up another sign, it, it comes back to us for a quick public meeting. But Mr. Mora, you had your hand up. Uh, I have something else, so you can go ahead. All right, <laughs> all right. to the sign. Wouldn't they just be replacing the existing sign, um, and if if that is the case, um, isn't this something that the building commission, to your point, Mr. Chair, the building commission could say it meets the size requirements, locations? Um, I mean, yeah, we could do we could do that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's yeah. It, it, we have done both uh, a lot of times, especially in residential neighborhoods. We like to have a, a the view of the sign to make sure that it's consistent, but. I think this one, if it, if it comports with the sign regulations, it should be fine. I'm just curious, is there even going to be a sign? Is this property going to have a name? It's not a, it's not a hotel that people need to find on a regular basis. Is it going to have a name beyond a number? It, it will. I know uh, Kurt's thinking about what that name may be. He's bandied about a couple of them, but it won't be University Lodge anymore. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Do we have other, any other questions, concerns about conditions? Then Mr. Mora, you had your hand up. And then Mr. Varner. Um, I think in the last meeting, either... Tom or Kurt mentioned that the parking area was going to be resurfaced and restriped. Uh, I'm not sure that shows up in a, a note on any of the plans, so we should make that a condition if that's in fact what's going to happen. Uh, good catch. Good catch. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mr. Moore, what exactly would you like it to say? Uh, just just make a note for uh, the, the parking area shall be resurfaced and restriped, and then we can, you know, make the connection to the plan when we finalize the conditions. Thanks. And we'll provide for flexibility for the staff to make technical conforming changes. Mr. Varner. Oh, you're muted. Just a quick question about a definition of inspection services. What, what are inspection services? This was in an art uh, a, a few uh, paragraphs back. Number eighteen. Uh, yeah, uh, to inspect. Yeah, the 
notification to inspection services. What what is inspection services and inspection services? Is that the, that's the city's inspection services, correct? The town's inspection services. Right, the inspection or, services department. And the reason for notifying them is that it would be in by, be beyond the lease if it extends if, it, if the uh, party is um, more than would be allowed by the lease they have to get permission from the town which is what that effectively does very good okay. party, certain size I guess it's for neighbor you know to um, reduce the likelihood of disturbance in the neighborhood in the residential neighborhood around them Thank you. All right. Um, if there are no further questions and there are no further amendments, I would I would entertain a motion that we approve the conditions as set forth above with the understanding as amended with the understanding that um, staff is is going to fill in some of the blanks and connect the parking uh, and, and uh, provide more detail regarding parking and other issues that we as we've discussed. Do I have a second? Do I have a motion and a second? So moved. Second. Second. Aye. Moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion on the motion to approve the conditions as amended and authorizing staff to make technical and conforming changes? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the conditions. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Varner? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Sloboder? Aye. The conditions are approved. The next order of business is to consider the findings we have to make pursuant to, um, I think we have to make a 9.2 finding. We, um, we have to, we can allow non-conforming use of the building, the structure or land to be changed to a specified use, not substantially different in character or in its effect on the neighborhood or the property of the vicinity. The said authority may also authorize a non-conforming use of building structure or land extending to the building. That's not, that's not our um, situation. So it's, this has been permitted before. It's an initial permit under um, hotels and motels. This was a pre-existing non-conforming use. And essentially we have to say that this is not, um, is not detrimental to the neighborhood. And I think we can, I feel confident we can make that finding. The next finding we have to make deals with 10.38. We don't have to make a finding under 3.32, I do not think. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we have to make findings under 10.38. The proposal is suitably located within the neighborhood which is proposed to enter the total town and is deemed appropriate by the special granting authority. The proposal is compatible with existing uses and other uses permitted. This is a, this has been a, a it's a, it's in a residential area. There is uh, our other, there's other multifamily, multi-unit uh, developments in the area, including the uh, sororities and other student housing. Um, and, it, and it's um, in a residential area, near close to downtown Amherst and UMass. 10.382, 383, 385, and 387 all deal with the nuisance of, um, to the neighborhood, uh, inconvenience and hazard to, but, to abutters, reasonably protects adjoining premises against detrimental and offensive units, uses, and provides convenient and safe vehicular and pedestrian traffic. I think they all are, I think that's, they've done that with the screening, with the downcast lights, without, um, with the, um, I think, the management by the management company of the staff, the limits on parties and noise, uh, all in the lease. I think that we can make the findings under 10.382, 383, 385, and 387. Um, 10.384 is adequate and appropriate facilities and provided for the proper operation of the proposed use. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that the staff review is really um, comports directly with that, but there are the, there are the connected to town water. It's got all the it's, it has the fire um, extinguishers. It's um, are not fire extinguishers, but the with the the, the um, 
the watering system to prevent the fire. I think that it's, everything is there for um, for the units to be occupied. Uh, town services. 10.386, the proposal ensures that the, in conformance with parking and sign regulations, the conditions do that. 10.387, the proposal provides convenient and safe vehicle movement. Um, we've talked about that. We um, and we I think made a determination that the, um, the, the parking area, while um, it is um, elevated and has a, a, a slope to it, is safe and convenient and provides for safe traffic in and out of the, out of the area as well as in the neighborhood. 10.388 ensures adequate space for off street loading and parking. Um, this isn't really as I don't think that's applicable. Uh, but there are conditions regarding moving, move in with uh, moving trucks, etc., that, that address that. Second, section three, 10.389, adequate vessels of disposal, I think, of disposal of storage or refuge and screening. We've talked about that, and they have um, two locations for um, siting the, the refuge bins. 10.389, 10.390. This is not applicable, 10.391, important natural um, structures. I don't think this is applicable, 10.392, adequate landscaping. Uh, the, the board, we've seen the landscaping. I think they provide adequate landscaping. It's not a lot of changes. 10.393, protection from adjacent party by minimizing intrusion of lighting. Um, this is basically downcast lighting and They've committed to have downcast lighting for both um, existing lighting and replacement, I mean, for replacement lighting. 10.394, I don't think is applicable. That deals with uh, disharmony with respect to terrain use and scale. There's no change in the building. 10.396 um, is the provide screening for storage areas. We've seen the plan for that. 10.397, proposal provides for adequate recreational facilities. Yeah, you know, I, I think they're adequate. They're not great, but there's sufficient and there's no changes from what had been previously approved. So I think we can find that. 10.398 proposals in harmony with the general purposes and intent of the bylaw and the goals of the master plan. I think it's true because it provides additional housing for students. So I think we've, unless there's any objections to the conditions and the finding to the findings at this point, I would entertain any discussion about the findings. If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the findings. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded to approve the findings. This chair votes aye. Mr. Varner? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Sloboder? Aye. So the next motion. The next order of business is to consider the uh, approval of the special permit application with conditions uh, as amended. Do I have such a motion to approve the special permit application and to close the hearing on this matter, public hearing on this matter? So, so moved. moved. It's, and I, I will take that as a second because we had so many movers. So it's been moved and seconded that we have uh, to approve the special permit. Um, I need the number. It's, I think it's ZBA 2025-3. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. 2025-3 um, with conditions. The chair votes aye. Mr. Varner? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Sloboder? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Thank aye. you very much. Congratulations. Good luck. Thanks. Thank you. All right. It's 814. We have one more proposal. I would um, like to take just a two minutes to grab a glass of water and then be back. So if we can come back here at eight in three or four minutes, and we can start up again. I would take our little break. All right. Sounds good. Great. We'll do it. Yeah. 
here. Oh, I just thought you may be in the bathroom because the door was closed. <laughs> Who did that first? Yeah, I don't know. But I, you must you must have been staying up late and watching TV like I was the last couple of days. Uh, I did that I, and then I I had to get up really early to catch the train down here to the city and <laughs> and then I've I've been in meetings all day long. Yeah, I've been I'm I'm tired tonight. I should have had a shot of coffee as opposed to a glass of water to stay awake for the rest of this. So well. And then we've got the rest of the convention after yeah. this. So, and so what that means is that I've recorded it, and so I'll be staying up really late. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> my my better half just sent me a text and was like, "If you don't mind, I'm just going to put it on. We can rewind it if you want to." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, I, I looked. I said, "Geez, it's going to be hard." It's it's so hard to run every, a convention on time, but uh, I I can't imagine that they are going to be able to do it tonight. How do you tell elected officials that they can only speak for twelve minutes? 
you know, when it's their one shot, it's their one shot to make a national name for themselves. It's tough. Impossible. Yeah. You'd need Nancy Pelosi hit with a gavel was the only way that that would work. She would, she'd be able to turn them off and shut them down and make them comply with the time. All right. Enough of that. Let's get to our next business order of business. Let's see, Mr. Mora, Mr. Henry, and Mr. Varner. Will, uh, Mr. Varner will not be on the panel for this, but he's welcome to stay. Mr. White will join us for this panel. All right, we've got everybody. The next order of business is ZBA FY 2025-01. YG Chestnut 161 LLC request for special permit under sections 3.3211 non-owner occupied duplex to change the land and use classification from non-owner occupied duplex to from owner occupied duplex to non-owner occupied duplex on the premises of 161 Chestnut Street map 11D parcel 66 in the RG general residence zoning district. Um, there was a site visit this week that I was not able to attend. I know that um, Mr. Sloviter attended, staff attended, and um, I think I think that's it. No, Mr. Mr. Henry was there. Mr. Henry attended as well. So, yes. you two guys, uh, can you briefly provide a, um, a summation of the site visit? I can. Do you want to go, Mr. Henry? Well, you can go, Mr. Sloviter. That's fine. All right. Um. We met there with the owner who is, it's a three bedroom cape with an attached auxiliary unit on a corner lot. The auxiliary unit has one bedroom upstairs and downstairs a kitchen and a common area, I guess you would call it in a bathroom. Um, and the owner is living currently downstairs in that unit and her kids are upstairs in that unit. Uh, the main house has two bedrooms and a bathroom upstairs, one bedroom and a powder room and kitchen and living room downstairs. There's a quite large basement in the main part of the building. And uh, there is a backyard with a swimming pool, an in-ground swimming pool. Uh, the applicant was not proposing any alterations to the building. She was clear about that. And it's, it's on a very nice corner lot near two schools, and otherwise the neighborhood seemed quite quiet. That's my impression. I don't know what Mr. Henry wants to add. And did um, Ms. Williams, were you also at the, the site visit? Anything else that we should, that would be responsive to Mr. Slover's question? No, I think he captured it all accurately. Um, I did note that there was a basement um, with a few extra rooms, but they're just gonna be used as storage and um, as a laundry room. Um, and nothing else out of the ordinary was observed. Oh, I will add though, there is no fence around the pool. There's a fence around the backyard, but there's no um, protective fence around the pool. That's it. Excuse me. I just got a message from Jeff Squire, who is an attendee, and he's asked to be admitted um, on behalf of the applicant. Thank you. Jeff is joining us. All right. Okay. All right. Um, we have this, the following submissions. Uh, we've received a, a ZBA application package, which includes a cover letter, an applicant application, permit findings and fees, a management plan, request for a butters list, photos of the site, rental lease agreement, um, and a, a site plan. We've also received uh, four public comments, one from Gene Kuhn, uh, second from Jean Kuhn and um, a note from uh, John Kuhn attached to it. One from Nancy Schroeder and an email from Barbara Berlin. Um, 
and we have also received a fire protection transmittal from Captain Bascom, the fire prevention officer for the city of, for the town of Amherst. Those are, I think, all the submissions that we've received. Is that right, Ms. Williams? Yes, that's correct. All right. Um, so, Ms. Yao, um, you're the, the uh, petitioner. Are you going to present or is Mr. Squire going to present for you? Or are you both going to do that? It'll probably be a tag team effort, but I will lead the charge. Okay, so then, then if it's going to be a tag team, let's get the name and address for the record for both of you. Great. Uh, I am Jeff Squire from the Berkshire Design Group uh, for Allen Place in Northampton. Ms. Ms. Yao? Hi. Hi, I'm Li Shang. I'm uh, can call me Leslie. So I oh, I'm sorry, Miss Li Shang, right? Yes, Li Shang. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah you can call me Leslie though. Oh, I, <laughs> so um, I currently my uh, my address is uh, 15 Jeffrey Lane, Amherst, right now. All right. Okay, Mr. Square. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, uh, here on behalf of uh, Lizzie Yao uh, with a property at the corner at 161 Chestnut Street, which is at the corner of Chestnut and Mattoon uh, across from the high school, um, just to the north. Um, this is a single family residential property. Um, zooming in uh, a little over a third of an acre. Um, as you noted, a, a Cape style home pool in the back of the uh, property, a shed, um, and then a wide driveway um, off of Chestnut Street. Uh, the property is all within the RG zoning district. And um, and at least in terms of previous permitting uh, history, uh, it did receive approval for a two-family um, uh, uh, two dwelling unit in uh, 1980. And this application before you tonight, request before you tonight, is simply to convert this, um, as you noted, from an owner-occupied to a non-owner-occupied dwelling unit. Uh, there's really no other changes taking place um, on the property. Um, the, the just a few images from the of the um, of the existing structure from Chestnut. This is Mattoon in the background here. Um, front of the building, as you can see, the driveway um, uh, that does have a garage and then two spaces adjacent to it. Uh, again, a view of the building, uh, the, the residence from the corner. Um, looking down Mattoon, this is the intersection uh, that we are just at here on the bottom image. So looking at the rear of the property, you can see the pool off to the left here. Um, and then again, a, a little closer up on the um on the Mattoon side is the side elevation is a small concrete patio, uh, the parking that exists uh, in front of the house, and then uh, the fencing that uh, protects that that side of the building. Um, the as I noted, the the application really is simply to convert this from a uh, an owner occupied to a non non owner occupied uh, dwelling unit. Um, there are a total of three bedrooms in the. Um, in one unit, in the first unit, which has three tenants. Uh, the second unit um, is one bedroom and would be, um, you know, ideally proof for one to two uh, tenants. Again, thinking about um, spouses or, um, you know, other family members that may need to be in a single bedroom apartment uh, or room, but that's uh, that's the intent of that second unit. So there's there's a total of, uh, of four bedrooms, um, we are providing uh, four parking spaces um, in total. Um, there are three spaces and the, the application did include a request for a waiver um, under the parking requirements, which restrict the number of cars to a maximum of two in, in the front setback. Um, this is an existing condition. We're not, again, uh, proposing to change anything. So I would like to take advantage of those three parking spaces. And then there's an additional one um, in the garage, this can be highlighted in this lower image here, just those three spaces. Each of those is is at least 10 feet wide by 18 feet deep. Um, I'm not sure the inside dimensions of the garage, but there's certainly space for a vehicle in there. 
Um, in terms of lighting, I know there were some questions, concerns about lighting or some clarity to it. Um, everything that's on the this the the existing building now is is proposed to remain. Um, there's nothing that is um, necessarily out of scale with the, the with the residential character of the of the building. These are just some examples of um, you know where the lighting is. There's a small sconce at the at the main entryway that's covered under um, under the uh, entry to the main uh, main building here. Um, there's some small wall sconces that flank the garage. There's a motion detected light uh, for security reasons above the garage. Um, there's a small wall sconce at the entrance um, off this side of the building, off the east side of the building, um, and then some small, you know, just uh, site fixtures, building mounted fixtures, sconces in the rear and to light the pool area. Um, but none of that is proposed to change um, and is, you know, certainly in character with, um, you know, the other residential uses around it. Um, the application did uh, did include uh, a management plan, which included provisions for trash and landscaping, uh, snow removal. Um, all of those were were detailed in the management plan. Uh, there was a sample lease that were provided. Um, you know, a lot of standard language. I think some of the highlights would be that there is a you know restriction on the number of uh, guests allowed to no more than four. Um, uh, there was an amendment, I understand, at the at the uh, late hour just to address concerns about the pool. So those were certainly um, acknowledged and added to the uh, lease. Um, and uh, yeah, landscaping and I, I think a complaint form was also provided uh, as an amendment to the uh, to the lease uh, as requested by um, by the town. Um, and so, yeah, I'm happy to answer any other questions. I think, um, you know, it doesn't change the intent or character of this particular, you know, use, this structure, um, the site and with the way it functions. Um, and so, uh, yeah, happy to answer any questions or clarify any, um, any remaining questions or, or concerns. Um, just a couple of quick questions. And Ms. Yao or Mr. Squire, first of all, Ms. Yao, I want to make sure I address you correctly. Uh, so I want to make sure it's right. How would you like me to address you? Ms. Yao or, or your... Sorry. Hello? Excuse Hello. Yeah. yeah. Could you repeat the question? Just, I want to make sure I, I, I'm respectful and re address you by your right name. So how would oh. you address you? Oh, Li Xiang. Li Shan, okay. Yes, Li Shan. Right. Ms. Li Shan, um, tell me how long have you owned this property? I purchased this property at the end of the April. April of this year? Yeah, this so year. It was the previous owners that did not have a rental permit since 2019. It was, you did not, you were not owning it then. So my question was, when was there, um, why, were you not, why was there not a rental permit on this? Okay, that's one question. Secondly, um, how many tenants do you intend to have in this property? So in the main building part, uh, there are three bedrooms. In that building, I intend to have three students, mm -hmm. one students each room. And in the apartment, in the apartment I think uh, one or two. Subject to, you know, maybe the couples, I don't know, because it's related by the unrelated people. So I have to say maybe two, maybe one, maybe two. Yeah. One or, one or two. All right. Um, and you're, do you live close by? I noticed the complaint response form has a North Andover address. Oh, but that is the registered company name. So, um, com company registered um, place. But the um, I purchased another property at fifteen Jeffrey Lane, Amherst. It's one point five miles away. It's located close to South Pleasant Street. So that is that will be my major uh, living location. In so, the so you live at at fifteen 
Jeffrey Lane. Jeff. Yes, yes. But the company is, okay, the company is headquartered in North Andover. Oh, yeah. All right. Okay. Um, Mr. Henry, you have a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I did, and you asked the first one um, because I, I read the lease and there's a note at the very bottom that says you're renting per bedroom, not per unit. Yeah. Um, so that was one of my questions. Um, my other question goes to the um, the waiver for the parking. So, um, and, and I miss Mr. Slobider's presentation of site. He captured everything correctly. I had internet issues, but um, so the waiver that you're asking for, um, there is a garage, and then there's, I mean, looking at the picture that you have right now, mm -hmm. um, where do you anticipate putting four cars? There's one in the garage, and the expectation that there'd be three, and is it tandem parking? How do you, if what what is the expectation for this parking? Right. So, I mean, as you know, that there, there would be the idea is that there is a, is a space in the garage. There is room for a third surface, you know, parking space because of the um, the expansive driveway there. So, you know, there there would have to be some shuffling of cars if that one in the garage needed to come out. But presumably that, you know, that's orchestrated amongst the tenants. So there's room to fit, you know, four cars you know, comfortably on the site without without changing anything. You mean in, in that space that we're looking at? Yes. And again, that is, so not including the actual garage itself. There would be in a car inside the garage and then three, you know, surface exterior parking spaces. Okay. Um, and then the studio apartment which is um the singular unit um did i hear correctly that the intent is to rent it to two people um i, I imagine it would be two people and i don't want to use re the word related but let me ask a different question there is no intent to put to have like um it'd be a shared space for two independent people, so to speak. No, no, similar to the, uh, just I under, overheard the previous hearing, but just, yeah, it the intention would be that it would be two related individuals somehow, whether it be a a, a sibling or a, a, a um, you know, a spouse or a child that there's there's one bedroom that would be, you know, available for up to up to two people that would be related somehow. Okay, and we, um, and you also have a basement. I just want to clarify mm -hmm. that um, the basement is not intended to be used for any living space, living purpose. Correct. Correct. Yeah, that that would violate code, right? Okay. Um, those are my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mrs. Squire. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sloviter. Uh, I just I had other questions, but Mr. Henry just asked a question and Mr. Squire responded, and I want to clarify something. The basement, you said that people living down there would violate something. What are you referring to? It, it's not intended to be a living unit, I guess. Right. But but you use the word violate. Um, I, and I just said Mr. Henry, and I don't understand it was more in response to to have it's a not, living I unit down there would violate the building for it would violate operation. the building code right or... i presume so there's no means of egress it's not it's not intended to be a a living unit a dwelling unit but it could be if it were properly permitted as such yeah it would need modifications there would you know it's 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 not designed to be a, a dwelling unit right now Right. No, I, I was there on the site visit and, uh, but it is a, a large space that would accommodate. So I just, I didn't, I didn't quite understand what it would violate. Uh, okay. Right. Uh, Mr. Squire, um, uh, this is to Mr. Squire. You said that this is 
uh, simply to convert it to a non-owner occupied um, setup, uh, and that it would not not change the character of the use. Do you do you uh, not think that a non-owner occupied changes the character of a property from an owner occupied? Uh, I guess that's a little bit of a question of opinion, right? That's not up to me necessarily. You know, I, I sure. I mean, there's some changes. I think, you know, they, they've got some very good tenants there now and intend to keep those tenants and want to keep those tenants. And so, um, you know, with a recent purchase of, uh, of another property in Amherst, um, they're seeking simply to, um, you know, um, you know, offer, continue to how to offer, housing opportunities in, in a place that has, you know, historically had, um, you know, rental units. So. Um, Actually, the woman we met at the property yeah. yesterday, Michelle, uh, said that there are no tenants in there now at all, that the property is not rented because when she bought it, uh, she couldn't rent. There was some issue with renting. And she said it was completely unoccupied now. I don't know. So when you say that they have some very good tenants that they want to retain, we were told yesterday there are no tenants. Uh, well, maybe, hello. Yeah. hello, may I speak to something? Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah probably my language expression um, makes some confusion here. Um, actually, now there's no tenant because I just purchased um, at the end of April. I didn't rent it out over summer, uh, not yet, but I will have potential tenant living in September 1st. As I mentioned in the uh, building, I have already submitted a renew um, uh, permit for, for, one, for one unit, not both of them, because I'm applying for not own occupied right now, but I have already submitted the renew, um, renewal of the uh, permit in August to the rental uh, department. So this is something update right now. And I'm sorry for if I, if I misspoke, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, what are your plans for the pool? It was closed, it had not been open this year. And uh, it's a very significant size pool. And what are the plans for when it will be opened? during the year um for given the pool, that it's a it, it's a short season anyway but what what are the plans please so the for the pool we definitely will open it every year because to maintain the set um what do you call it? to make the water clean and to make not you know if we do not open the pool it, it will create a lot of insects even it is this um salty water pool so this year because i purchased this property too late and as i spent a lot of time to figure out how to manage a salty water pool because i have no experience until i get this confirmation from the private seller and they gave me the full instruction uh, who i supposed to touch uh, who i supposed to um confirm the cost and then for this year, because it's too late, I didn't open it. But for next year, definitely I'm going to open it. For the um, management, um, after the house inspection, I think about it overnight. I feel like um, the pool every year, normally we open it um, between June, like at the end of June to at the end of August, two months a year. This is pretty much the plan. And during this two months, I suppose, I feel like not many students living in the house because most of them, they will go out, go back home. But maybe some, they have some friends or living inside the house, maybe some rent or something. I was considering to uh, put a swimming pool addendum, an official clause into the lease because it's to, uh, I have two concerns. One is for the safety concern. Another one is they do not disturb the neighbors, no parties at all. So I feel like that would be necessary for us to update our lease. And and what would that what would that say? What would the lease say regarding the pool? When you uh, uh, Mr. 
Uh, Jeff, could you could you share the screen about the the uh, swimming yes. pool attendant? Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, let me find that. So let me share this. So can everybody see that? Is a swimming pool addendum? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this runs through, yeah, the, the gist of the addendum, um, which would disclose that, yeah, it's it's only for tenants uh, and guests at their own risks. Uh, no children under 20 or under 14 are allowed. Uh, reasonable caution when using the pool. And those aren't responsible. Pool is not guaranteed. And so I think, yeah, if there's, if we need to add some provisions to ensure, you know, um, um, uh, you know, um, the the number of people or or anything that's that's fine too. But I think generally it's it's to acknowledge that the the pool um, is an additional component that needs to be considered in the lease. So, are you going to issue a twelve month? Will your tenants be signing a twelve month lease? Original or originally, I. I'm thinking to sign a 12 month lease originally, but consider this pool, I might sign nine month lease maybe. So still because the lease has not been fixed yet. So I'm still thinking about the pool because this is something I really concern. If I cover this pool by myself, supervised by myself, or maybe my family um, have the summer house uh, to uh, sleep there. So that's a good option for me too. So maybe I consider to nine month lease, but originally for, um, you know, normally Amherst the students lease is almost like 12 month, most of them, but I may, th I may think of nine month lease at this point. And if you, if you, operated with nine month leases based on the school year, then the students who rent during the school year would not be there in the summer. Is that correct? Yes, this is what I'm thinking right now because and I feel like concerns, yeah. And then would the house simply be vacant and just for the use of your family in the summer or who might um, use the house in the summer? The summer day, actually we Probably because, you know, uh, I have a lot of friends uh, from uh, all over the world. They are they are like just two months living in Amherst for like uh, international switch or just, the, you know, summer program, probably just one or two months. I do have some friends. They ask me to, you know, leave two months, maybe just one or two months short time, maybe it's a good option for me, or I have my family need to play a place, you know, leave a place to uh, spend the summer. So this is all the two options for family use or for my friends, you know, they have short term needs in Amherst too. So maybe. Um, okay, uh, that's all my questions for now. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, the quite, one of the concerns I have is if you don't have a clear plan for how the house is going to be occupied, how do you ensure the, the pool is safe and that you don't have other people, children uh, wandering into the pool and you know, scaling over the fence and jumping into the pool? I mean, if you have people around it tends to be less. I mean, they're not around 24 seven all the time, no matter what occupancy you have, but you're more, you're more likely to have people around and that would prevent some of that. So concern is, is the, the safety. Um, the pool can be, it can be inherently dangerous if it's not monitored and fenced off. And what is your thinking on that? May I ask a question? So, so for this, um, for this pool, so in Amherst, it's, um, how to say? 
So nine months is good option for students' safety. I don't want the students to swim in the pool because it's sometimes, you know, teenager. But if it, if we concern the summer day, the house weekend, or someone will escape the fence, go inside the pool, that's much dangerous for me, actually, than the students' rental. Um, if this is the case, if this is the concern, I feel like the twelve month is the best op is the best option for me because this is some que this is a question I need to figure out um, from the hearing or from, you know, to write email to the town. I need to figure out how risk for the pool it is. But now I it is clear, so I definitely can sign a twelve month lease for sure. So yeah, if this is concern, I can confirm here. Um, I think I said, yeah, Mr. Henry. I think Ms. Williams is first. Oh. Hi, Chair Judge. I just wanted to add, um, when we were at the site on Tuesday, the pool was completely um, covered, like it's locked and it has a, a cover on it that I think you can't exactly just like easily get into. So even though it's not fenced off directly, it is not just opened out. It is covered. I don't know if that helps or not. But well, it does, but the pool, I mean, that's a, a pool cover that can be removed if, if you were having 12, uh, two months leases. Right? I think so. Um, I. Yep. Who is speaking? Go ahead. Was that you, Mr. Henry? Yes. I, so to your point, yes, the, the pool was um, covered to Ms. Williams point, but to your question, it is plausible that um, somebody could open it. It, it did seem quite, um, you need to know what you're doing to be able to do so. Yeah. Um, but my question for was for Ms. Yao. Um, so owner occupied rental, um, when you purchase the unit from the previous owners, did you get a background on um, the prior uh mr henry um we're, we're you're breaking up and you're and you're kind of frozen your video is frozen we're losing you can you try again maybe you need to uh, leave and then come back can, because you're fro you're currently frozen. So, um, let's. I have another. I do have a question, Ms. Yao. Um, I found that you're you're least unusual in that you have the lessee, the renters, are in charge of making sure that the lawn is mowed and paying for the maintenance of the lawn being mowed, and the same thing with snow removal. You, I mean, I think it says someplace later that you're going to um, reimburse them for the actual costs, but they have to put out money for the, they have to put out money for the, the yard by the mowing and they have to put out the money and organize the, um, the snow removal. And I'm just wondering why that shouldn't be the responsibility of the owner and not the responsibility of the tenants. I mean, one of the things that students may not care so much about is um, making sure that the side, whatever sidewalk or the the, the, the road is, the, the, the driveway is cleared. Um, and they probably don't care as much about the, uh, they may not care as much about the lawn and it would norm, it's normally the requirement of the, the uh, landlord who does care about these things. I mean, that's the, it's your property to maintain and that's, it's all in your best interest. So I, I'm thinking that you have a possibility of more of of um, not maintaining the property as well as if you were responsible for those things without having the students, the tenants, contract, pay for, and then get reimbursed for the services, which are pretty essential services: lawn mowing, snow removal, and garbage. Can you talk to me about your thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, actually. Uh... In this lease, um, at the first page, on the first page, um, there is um clause about the um 
the the rental rental charge. So actually, we have already calculated average month utility plus um long maintenance plus spring and fall cleanup plus like and I calculated like four times snow snow plowing as an average charge. So I give all the cost add up together. I up together and minus 12 months and I get average average every month cost average. So it's around like 450 to 500 per month. So I charge the student each of them 150 per month. So this is will listed on the first um the first clause of the pricing clause. We have the basic rental charge plus a utility all inclusive charge for the cost. So it's 150 per month. So they're gonna pay us in total. But I have but I list all these covered, you know, 150 inclusive which part of the um the cost. So that's why I gave the different list. For example, the gas, electricity, natural um the uh, cleaning and and um the snow blowing. So that's why I list the different in different clouds, different term. I'm sorry, I'm still very confused. Yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, very, I'm so sorry. Very, 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 very simple yes or no. Do the lessees pay for snow and garbage removal? No, no, garbage. Garbage is my turn. Garbage is, I pay for the garbage. But they pay for snow and landscaping. Yes, but they, they already pay by every month, in every month charge. It but, sounds like it's included in the cost of the rental fee. Yes. And they're not expected to pay for that out of pocket as those services are needed. That yeah, they're, yeah. they're up front and part of the part of the rental fee. Yeah. Yes. Well, it looks to me like it's I mean, there it's, may be some discrepancy in the lease. Yes. It looks to me like I and mean, it's kind of your decision how you want to rent this out. I mean, it's, it's, uh, my concern is how that affects how, the maintenance. But it sounds to me like you rent. There's a cost for rent. And then there's a cost for the the yard, and there's a cost for snow. That's all added on to their monthly payment for rent. So they have a base rent, and then we'll call it landscaping fee each month. They have a snow fee each month that you've averaged out over the course of the, the lease, and they have a utility fee, water fee each month as well, on top of the the rental fee. Yes. So they are they are paying for it. Yeah, they are paying for it, but I gonna. Uh, I'm going to find a company who maintains the yard. I'm going to pay all this charge to the company, to the snow plowing company, to the mm -hmm. land company. It's Amherst Nursery. Yeah. Yeah. John, I'm Amherst Nursery. But whomever rents the property has to pay you back. Who? Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it, it's, I think there's a discrepancy in yeah, there. There's something wrong. With, that's not what right. the lease, it's not how the lease reads. The right. lease reads that you're going to, get money from them each month and then they're going to pay the cost for the landscape and they're going to pay the cost for this on as well for the the snow removal um, oh. so, i mean it's, there is a discrepancy between what's yes. on the first page and what's on page three yes because they, they are contracted with maintenance companies for each of those items the trash removal landscaping snow removal they do have contracts as a as a you know management entity to to maintain that stuff. It's not it's not on the responsibility of the tenants to pay oh, for and or organize that. Oh. So yes, I agree. There's a discrepancy there somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So that's un unusual. And I think it could have implications for property maintenance. But yep. that's well, that's one question I have. Um is there other are there other questions from other so Rob, I noticed that the parking, the parking looks like it encroaches on the front setback, but is that a long, is that because the, an earlier special permit waived the parking, the, the dimensional requirements, and so they were allowed to park within that setback, or is this, does this require a need for a waiver for the, the front setback? It, it doesn't require a waiver at this time. It was uh, indicated on the drawings in the 1980 special permit. 
Uh, so we had looked that up and saw that the three parking spaces were shown there. Uh, I didn't go further to see if the bylaw actually restricted it at that time. I don't think it did. I think that's a, a more recent provision. Uh, so it likely is a pre-existing non-conforming condition, but uh, it was no doubt part of the approval back in 1980. 1980, so it's pre-existing non, all right, non-conforming. Thank you for that. Otherwise we wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't otherwise be permitted, yep. I think. All right. Um, people have other questions. I guess my, I, I do, I have a concern about the pool and just safety and, uh, and, and then the uncertainty that about what you're going to do kind of adds to that. I'm, I'm kind of up in the air about what your plans are at this point in terms of, of that. Um, you know, if, it, if their students aren't there and, and they're only, you've got a 10 month lease and they're gone. Maybe you're, you have people coming in and out. Maybe you have, maybe you use it. Maybe your friends use it. Maybe, you know, I don't know if it's rented out for a short-term basis. Um, but I, I just, I, I, I'm not quite sure about how you plan. And I don't think you are, how you plan to provide for the property during the summer. And I think that's something we need. We need to know what your thinking is um, yeah. so we could, because I think if you're going to have short term, uh, if you, I would, I, and I just thought of this, I and mean, then Rob, please tell me if I'm, and, or Ms. Westbrook, tell me if I'm wrong. But if you have two months where you lease this out on a short term basis, you may need, I don't know if it's permitted in that district, and you may need uh, other, other approvals or a waiver to do that. I'm not sure if you can rent it out for a week or two or for a day. Um, I'm just not, I don't know what the rules would be for, property in that district. I hadn't thought of that till just now. What's the, what's the requirement, Rob? Is that allowed? Mr. Moore, is that allowed? It's, it's allowed. We don't have local regulation on, you know, Airbnb or short-term rental. Okay. All right. Mr. Sloboder. Oh, I mean, uh, wait, before I, Ms. Ms. Yao, do you have anything else to add to my um, rambling question about what your decision is? Okay. If I could just offer one, yeah, if I could just offer one bit of it, um, just suggestion or thought that, um, you know, I think part of it is is obviously going to be weather dependent that, you know, every every summer weekends, you know, it's, it's hard to predict, you know, the use of of particularly the seasonal elements like the pool, um, you know, instead of sort of, a, you know, this is what's going to happen every weekend or every week. So there's that. But I think the, you know, one of the advantages of technology that I've seen employed in a lot of places is that, you know, video monitoring is very easy to do now. And so I think there would be, you know, that potentially may be a solution is particularly with a, you know, a residence close by that there's, there's a very easy way to, to have a video monitor that sets off an alarm when, you know, somebody's there that shouldn't be there. You know, we've seen it, you know, in multiple cases for multiple instances, but that would be a very, you know, sort of effective way to, if somebody's not there to monitor the pool, um, you know, uh, again, just from a, from a reasonably close distance. So just offering that as a suggestion. Mr. Sloboder. So uh, first I just wanted to give a little informational uh, point on the pool. I saw the cover there yesterday. I'm actually familiar with this cover. It's um, it secures the pool for being normally winterized. It's difficult to remove the cover as it was there. And it is absolutely a seasonal process. It's the cover you put on when you're not going to use it. Most, most people in the North put the cover on in late September or something like that. And it doesn't come off until May. It's, it's difficult to install. It's difficult to remove. It's very secure. But it's absolutely not the cover that would be used during the swimming season. So as secure as the pool is now, this is not the cover that will, that will make it safe when it is open for use in the summer. Uh, I don't know what cover would because covers in, for pools are usually very, they're usually bubble, almost like bubble wrap. Mm -hmm. And they come off easily because nobody wants to spend two hours opening it every day for a 20 minute swim. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to ask the applicant uh, if for the, the summer, if you're only going to have a nine month lease, 
Are you considering Airbnb or some sort of operation like that for the for the summer months for revenue and for use? Uh, actually, Airbnb is very good because in Amherst, not you know, Amherst is always lack of like housing. In the summer, it's a hot season. A lot of people come from all over the world to attend the summer camp. Um, or the uh, temporary like two month study something like that. So a lot of people wants to come to here, and this is a good location. So Airbnb is a good option, but I just and this is something I I didn't figure out yet. Is that is there any regulation if I run nine months for like a student rental and another three months in the summer they run as Airbnb? Because as I know. Amherst is very hot. It's hard to book a, a, a house here as Airbnb. It's very hot. So I'm pretty sure the occup occupancy will be very full, I think. So so nobody, you know, we, we will not leave the house empty even for maybe three days between, mm -hmm. between two guests. So I, I want to ask, is it allowed me to do that? Do Airbnb for three months and nine months for student rental is okay? You know, I think the answer from Mr. Mora was that it's that there's no restriction on Airbnb in that zoning district. Is that correct? Short term, no restriction on short term rental. That's correct. So any restriction would be one that this board places as a condition of the permit if there were to be one. Okay. Um, are there other questions from board members? Not a, not a question, Mr. Chair, but I, I have concerns. Um, about the lease and the responsibilities of the tenants, given the fact that um, the intent here is to rent each bedroom to a different individual. Um, so I, I would um, prefer to see a finalized clean lease, so to speak, um, that is very definitive as to what um, the lessees will be responsible for. And for full disclosure, I wouldn't be comfortable voting yes or no until I see that. I, you know, and, and I also would like to understand the, the, how you're going to allocate parking. That would, because uh, you have potential for five people. How do you allocate parking? Do you have assigned parking? Is parking come with a lease? How do you make a decision on that? Is something else? Um, is there no other questions at this time? It's, it's, Mr. White has, Henry, yep. Mr. White has his hand up. Oh, I didn't. You know, those books are really hard to see that yellow hand. And so does Mr. Meadows. So, Mr. White, thank you. You you helped me a lot, Mr. Henry. I don't always notice those hands, so thank you. Mr. White. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would echo a lot of what Mr. Henry said uh, as well. Um, Given the lease that we've been presented with, um, even coming down to the length of the duration of the lease, uh, we just have, in my opinion, far too many unanswered questions. Um, and to be brutally honest, I also wouldn't really feel confident uh, voting on this in its current state tonight. I mean, I also have concerns with that being a corner lot. I myself live on a corner lot. Um, and with four cars, one being in a garage, a school being right across the street, how does when the school is in operation, how does the traffic flow pattern of people dropping off their store, picking up students affect the ability of people to get in and out of the unit? There's just, I have a lot of questions right now that I would feel much more comfortable if we could kind of gain more information, get a more firm lease, mm -hmm. and then maybe vote then on this. Mr. Meadows? Uh, I, I agree with what's been said about the lease, but I, I also have to add that this is an extremely busy intersection. When when school is in session, you get 
buses going down from the high school to the middle school. You get buses coming down the street and turning into the middle school. You have buses coming up and going into this middle school. You have cars for all the teachers going to, through that intersection into the parking spots. You have, in, including my grandson who walks by there every, you know, my, my earbuds just collapsed. Can you hear me? Yep, yep. we sure can. Uh, I can't hear you, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> they, uh, my grandson walks through there at least twice a day um, on foot. He and his friends go by there twice a day. Um, my granddaughter used to, well, all of my kids have gone through there on a consistent basis. It's not a good place to have uh, a non-owner occupied um, group of students. Uh, there is a house across the street, across Mattoon Street that is rented to students. They're in the yard throwing Frisbees and balls all the time into Mattoon Street, kids running into the street to grab the, the uh, Frisbees, to grab the, the balls. If they're, that house is rented out to a number of students, they're gonna be intersect, intertwined with the students across Mattoon Street. I, I, I cannot support this request. Um. So I think the next order of business, we do need to get some public comment. Um, and I want to- I'm going to sign out and sign back in again. All right. I, I want to give the opportunity for public comment before we move on to a public meeting, but I do want to provide that. And then if there are people who have uh, a desire to speak, they may, if you do desire to speak, please raise your hand uh, through using Zoom. If you are so recognized, state your name and address, address your comments to the board. The applicant will have an opportunity to respond to each of the individual comments after all the comments are made. Uh, and then we'll have a chance for more board comments and discussions. But this is a time for public comment. And so uh, if you wish to speak, I think we have one, we have a, a Trevor Morris, I think, has, his, has the hand up. And keep your comments to about three minutes, and I'll try to help you do that. All right, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep, we can. So I live at 123 Chestnut Street, just a, a few doors down. Uh, my daughter was able to walk to the middle school and high school, uh, much as uh, someone said their grandchildren and, and others have done. Um, Thanks to Mr. Meadows for characterizing quite well the house across the street on Mattoon Street that's already rented out to students. I, I'll echo those concerns about having yet another student house and that, that turning into a, a, you know, sort of a party area. Um, there is also an elementary school right uh, across the hill. So uh, also in the, in the a minor point in the picture that Mr. Squire showed, uh, he said the that showed that the high school is to the north. That's actually the middle school. the The high school is is south. So that was there was something wrong on that uh, diagram. Um, I'll just reiterate that uh, Ms. Li, Li Shang uh, bought the house just in April. Clearly had no intent of actually uh, living in the this clearly zoned uh, owner occupant. Uh, property. Uh, it looks to me like it, it's a, a money grab, an, an, an attempt to take what should be a, a family dwelling, uh, appropriate for people who want to send their kids to school and raise their, their families here in Amherst, and uh, just convert it into student housing. It's not really at all appropriate for this neighborhood or for this, uh, this, um, this house. Uh, so regarding the nature of the property, uh, Mr. Squire said, this won't change the nature of the property. Turning it into an Airbnb, having students there, very much will change the nature of the property. Very different from uh, a few years ago when we had a neighborhood uh, gathering of all uh, families who came together and met uh, at the house and had a, a, just a neighborhood block party. So it absolutely will change. Uh, so. 
to summarize, uh, I strongly oppose this uh, unwarranted zoning change. Thank you, Mr. Morris. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? I see we have a Nancy Schroeder hand is up. Uh, can we bring Ms. Schroeder in? It just takes a minute, um, oh, but she's on her way. <laughs> okay, there we go. Ms. Schroeder, you're, there we go. All right. Can you hear me? Now I do, yes. Hi, do you hear me? Yes, we do hear you. Do you hear us? I'm sorry. One more time. Do you hear me? Yes, we do hear you. Okay. There we go. Um, I guess the first thing I wanted to say oh, was- Give us your address, please, Ms. Schroeder. Uh, 168 High Street. Okay. Which is, uh, De well, it's 168. So it's three houses down from the uh, 161 Chestnut. It's on the other side of Mattoon Street, uh, across from the middle school. And I I didn't know whether I should read my letter aloud or whether you had the opportunity to 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 read it already. Well, I have read, but sure, however you want to present it is fine. Okay, maybe I'll read it. But I also wanted to address the parking issue. Uh, what's going to happen with the parking? Is it two or three of the cars will be parked across the street in the middle school lot? Um, we all do that. <laughs> you know, there's always parked. There's always cars. Uh, from the neighborhood parked in the middle school lot. Um, so just whatever for whatever, whatever that's worth. Uh, I'll read my letter. I am a homeowner and live with my family at 168 High Street in Amherst. I object to the request to change the land use classification from owner occupied duplex to non owner occupied duplex at 161 Chestnut Street. Regardless of who owns the house now and what their intentions are, my experience is that a non-owner occupied house opens the door to student re rentals now or in the future. As you face our house, the two houses to the right are both student rental properties. Our experience living next to student housing has been poor at best. Every fall, I introduce myself, welcome them, and tell the students that this is a family neighborhood. I get the phone number of one of the many students in both houses. None of that matters late at night when the parties spill out into the pork, into the back porch, front lawn, and middle school parking lot. Shouting, incredibly loud music, and cars peeling out of the parking lot are the norm on fall and spring weekends, which start on Thursday nights. One day, one of the students who lived within a few feet of our house started shooting his BB gun into our adjoining backyards. The folks who previously owned 161 Chestnut, Court, Chestnut Street had, qu had quiet tenants because the tenants lived in the same house as the owner. Please don't allow this to change. Our neighborhood cannot absorb a row of student rental houses. Some of us owners will give up and leave. Thank you for your consideration. So thank you for hearing. Thank you, Ms. Schroeder. All right. I guess the next we we have uh, Nancy Schwartz. Nancy Schwartz. Yep. Okay. All set. Thank you. I, I did uh, send in an email uh, yesterday uh, to Ms. Brestrup. I don't think it may have gotten included uh, in your packet. So I'm, I'm just going to read it just to... Okay. And just give us your address, please. Sorry. Over thank here. you. Nancy Schwartz, 153 High Street. Oh, about, right. six, about six houses around the corner, four or five houses uh, from the, the Chestnut property uh, street in question. Um, as a resident homeowner at 153 High Street for 32 years, I object to the request for the special permit at 161 Chestnut Street from owner-occupied duplex to non-owner-occupied duplex. Our neighborhood of Upper High Street and Chestnut Street has maintained a mostly quiet mix 
of single family homes, owner occupied duplexes, and a few single family rentals. I see this trend happening in this neighborhood and others for investors to buy properties and turn them into mostly student rentals. Obtaining a special permit, taking away the owner occupied provision should not be taken lightly and should take into account neighborhood concerns about noise, traffic and owner responsibility. My husband and I have successfully managed our own owner occupied duplex for over three decades with absolutely no issues to our neighbors. That is because we live on site. We are careful to screen tenants and we respect the peace and privacy of the neighborhood. I've witnessed firsthand that when a property switches from owner to non-owner occupied, as directly in back of us at 174 North Whitney Street, the incidence of uncontrolled noise and disturbances is greatly increased. Non-resident landlords have limited accountability to the neighbors in my experience. We as a town should do all we can to preserve owner occupied duplexes and to provide an entry point for home ownership for first time home owners and middle income buyers. Thank you for your consideration and I hope you'll agree that this special permit is not in the best interest of our neighborhood. That was that was my email. I, I have to say after after attending this hearing tonight, I, I, I I'm so glad that Mr. Meadows brought up the fact that you unlike the visit that site visit a few days ago, this is that is not a quiet area. It's an extremely heavily trafficked intersection. It's a four way stop sign. And especially at school hours, it is hectic. And and the students but walking, cars turning. I can't even imagine uh, all the cars that might be parked in that driveway trying to back out and, and access uh, street traffic. It, it would be horrendous. I'm also, I, I'm actually taken aback by the, the owner's proposed uh, rental plan. Not only is she going to maybe rent out as a non-owner occupied unit, she sounds like she's going to intensely look to rent out every room during every possible week or month out of the year. I, I, I see this as an egregious overstep of the, uh, of the, the use. And I, I, I'm appalled that somebody would buy a property zoned this way and think that it would be an easy thing to switch just so that they can, uh, make make money off of our, our our population here, our student population. So I will un end my comments on that. And I thank you for listening. Thank you. I see no other hands raised. Um, Michelle, you have an opportunity, Mr. Square, you have an opportunity to respond to the public comments. And then I think we'll um, just, we'll, we'll uh, have a discussion amongst board members. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think everything that's been said has been, um, you know, absolutely heard and, um, you know, really just pointing out that, um, you know, we're not proposing to change, you know, the, the traffic patterns, um, you know, it would be the same number of cars parked there, um, you know, under the proposed condition as are allowed now. We're not seeking to violate that all at all. So, you know, obviously that there's going to be limitations to to how much traffic um, this site could possibly generate. Um, but absolutely, you know, heard heard all the concerns and we can return, um, you know, with a lease that's a little bit more defined and, and clarifies some of those responsibilities. Um, and um, yeah, it looks at looks at what else we might be able to do to relieve some of the you know concerns we heard tonight. Um, and I don't know whether, yeah, Leslie, you want to say anything else, but um, I don't know if there's any other, yeah, any other requests of the board at the moment. Well, I think it seems to me, number one, we need to have at least clarified in the conflicts resolved one way or the other, number one. Number two, I think it would be, it makes sense to me to, for, for you to describe what your plan is for how you want to lease out the property. Uh, in those two months, are there, is it a 12 month lease, a 10, nine month lease, short term rentals? What are you going to use it? I just mm -hmm. plan makes, I think you need to make a plan. Um, I think that 
there's some, I don't know if that's going to resolve everybody's questions about the, the, uh, the permit. I think you heard some uh, other concerns raised that I don't know if they're able to be resolved uh, with additional information. But those are the two that I have that come to mind right away. Mr. Henry, I see your hand up. You do, Mr. Chair, thank you. So um, I, I am very student housing friendly, but um, I, I, I do have very serious concerns. And having walked through the property, um, I, I am not gonna support it if it's like rent every single bedroom to a different person. I just wanna put that on the record. So um, I would suggest that the applicants reconsider um, this. I, I, I don't think the converting the living room into a bedroom, um, I, I'm, a, I'm in oppos opposition to that. And I, I understand, you know, there's two adequate bedrooms upstairs, shared space downstairs, um, but to rent every single room to a different person, I am not gonna support that. Other comments from board members? I I would like to vote on this tonight. You're you're willing to um, vote? You have your your mind made up already? In Absolutely. That's it's a very inappropriate place for that. Mr. Slobiter, I agree with Mr. Meadows. I would like to vote on this tonight, and uh, I presume at some point. You're going to go to a public meeting yep. when we can discuss it and take a vote. So I would encourage that we do that so that I can make the comments that I want to make in the public meeting and not now. And I'm sure other people may have comments if they haven't already been made. All right. Um... I'm going to ask the opinion of the board. We have two members who'd like to do this tonight. It's late. Um, my original thought was we set this for another date, but um, it sounds like another date for at least two of the members isn't going to, ch there's not additional information that will change their mind. Um, so I, I guess I'd like to get a, a feeling from the board. Do we want to go into public? Uh, do we want to go into a public um, a meeting so we can discuss this more? And it sounds like we got two, at least two people that do, and and you want it'll take another half hour, but that's you know we'll if you want to spend it tonight, we certainly can. Or Mr. Ch Mr. Chair, yep. do we do we have to go into a public meeting in order to in order to vote on the application? Yeah. Yes. Well, we, okay. we have to, okay. but we I don't think we have to. But it only takes a second to get into a public meeting, and that's the best place to have the discussion. I don't want I don't want to change anything. I just was curious. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you. All right. Um, Mr. So, Chair, my yes. my position, my position would be um fundamental fairness. I understand Mr. Meadows' concern and Mr. Silva's position, but I think given that um there's a lot of incompleteness with what's presented, give them the opportunity to go back, fix those things and come back. Um, and if the answer is a no, then it's a no then, but I think they should have the opportunity to make corrections and satisfy some of our concerns. So here's what I'm gonna do. We're gonna go into public, we're gonna, I would move to be go into a public meeting and allow the discussion we can, and that exactly the point you made and Mr. Meadows has made and Mr. Slover can make, we can discuss those further if that's, and we can take a vote either just to, to um, make a decision on it or to continue the meeting someplace else. And that we give everybody the opportunity to speak. And so that's what I think is the best thing to do. Um, and the, the fairest thing to do for both the members as well as the applicant. So I would entertain a motion that we move into a public meeting um, while keeping the public hearing open in case we come back and and do um, um, and come back and do consider this, and we move on into a public public meeting while keeping the public hearing open. Do I have such a motion? So, so moved. All right, I've moved and seconded. I don't think there's any discussion. The chair votes aye. Mr. White, aye. Mr. Meadow, Mr. Henry, aye. Mr. Meadows, aye. Mr. Sloviter, aye. All right. We're now in a public hearing, which is typically not a time for public comment, and it's a time when the board deliberates on the matter before us. So um, 
Mr. Henry, I heard you say that you would prefer to give the applicant a chance to come back and try to fix it, and perhaps it could warrant your um, approval with if changes were made. And I think that would be a fair that summary. Is correct. That is correct, Mr. Chair. It looks to, it looks to me like Mr. Meadows just thinks this is not well not well situated, and uh, further changes to the lease and other things that may come back are not going to change your opinion about whether this is suitably located in this area, correct? That's correct. Um, I don't know what, what you think, Mr. Sloboder or Mr. White. Why don't you, uh, Mr. Sloboder, you've spoken. What do you, what's your view? Okay. Um, I just want to take my hand down. All right, there it is. Um, I think that this application and this proposal is so flawed that nothing can fix it. I have concerns that I haven't even really brought up yet about the number of people who could live in this house. There's a there's a common practice in this town in student rentals that in order to uh, reduce the per head monthly charge that they I've seen places where people live in the living rooms and and you get many more people. The basement of this property is an, a big, quite nice room. It's a little musty now, but nothing that a dehumidifier wouldn't take care of in a couple of weeks. Everything that Mr. Meadows said about his grandchildren going to school and the, the activity, everything that the letter writers uh, said that they are unanimous in their opposition. Uh, Mr. Squire said that this proposal would not change the character of the property. I disagree with that. Um, the building may be consistent with the neighborhood, but non-owner occupied by students is not going to be consistent. So for all of those reasons, the traffic, Mr. Meadows points, the neighbors, I don't see how anything about this proposal could be fixed, and uh, I was, I'm going to oppose it, and I don't see any point in bringing it back, because nothing is going to change. And uh, so I'm, I'm also not going to support this, and I will oppose it, and I will oppose them even bringing it back. Thank you, Mr. Chair. But Thank you, Mr. Sloater. Mr. White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll try to make this brief. Um, basically, uh, I will not feel comfortable voting tonight because we have incomplete information. Um, to me, a big part of public service and how we serve our communities is try to try to have all of the information before we render a decision in the affirmative or in the negative. And, you know, I agree with pretty much every point that's been said tonight. However, I would not feel comfortable voting on this at this point. We have so many questions and so many things that just that we don't have answers for. Um, but that's where I'm at. Thank you. And so is, is your position that you would want to continue this or is your position that this is that we don't have enough information and that you don't want it, you're ready to oppose it? Is because you don't have the information. I'm not sure I know where you're coming from. Uh, well, I mean, at this point, uh, I mean, given everything that's been said and the evidence, or excuse me, the documentation we've been presented with, uh, I would be in opposition to this. Uh, however, I was just letting you know as a chair and as a board yeah. that I don't feel confident in issuing a vote, a vote in the affirmative or the negative. Um, okay. I understand. Mr. Henry, um, you voiced your opinion when we were in the public hearing. I want to give you a chance to talk again on the uh, in the public meeting. As is, Mr. Chair, I would not support it, but I also believe that we should give them an opportunity to make some corrections. Um, I, I understand, you know, half the board is potentially going to vote no, but I think they should be afforded the opportunity to um, go back and come back with a better case and make that case. Got it. Well, it seems to me the best, the best process here is to um, 
give Mr. Henry an opportunity to vote um, on his his notion, which is to uh, continue to a later date. If we vote that down, we move to then we have there's the affirmative vote to um, vote it either to approve it or to disapprove it. And I think that that's fair because everybody is shot at the vote that they wish. So the first, I would think the way we'd want to do this is give the opportunity to, to for the board members to vote whether they want to continue it. If that doesn't pass, then we move to um, to to uh, consider approving or disapproving the motion. So that's how I'd like to handle this and give everybody a chance to um, have their vote in front of the in front of the body. So what I would like to do is entertain a motion that we continue that's this. Ms. Bestrup has her hand up, Mr. Chair. What's that? Ms. Bestrup has her I, hand up. Oh, yes. I just wanted to mention that um, this isn't going to be, it, whatever vote you take, it's not going to pass if three people vote right. yes, because you need four people to vote yes. Just wanted right. to remind everybody of that. Yeah, I think we know that. All right. Um, Mr. Henry, I would entertain a motion to um, continue this to a date um, to two, um, two meetings out um, is so moved. Is there a, a motion to entertain this for uh, a month from now, the next meeting a month from now, and we'll put the date in, which I think would be uh, mid-September. So I'll move, Mr. Chair. Is there a second to that motion? Second. So moved and seconded. This requires um, a majority vote. Um, any discussion? I think we've all had a discussion. The chair votes no. Mr. White, Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Sloboder? You're muted, Mr. Sloboder. I think Mr. Sloboder is a, a no. I was mute. I was a muted no. Now I'm an unmuted no. And Mr. Meadows? No. All right. So the motion to continue this has failed. The uh, next motion would be on approving the um, or, or just uh, approving the the um, project app the uh, uh, application. The effect of this is if you vote yes, we approve the application. If we vote no, um, the application is denied. It needs four votes to um, approve the app the special permit application. Are there any questions or discussion from members? Okay. Um, can I just interject for a moment, Chair Judge? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if the applicant is aware that they have the ability to withdraw their application, seeing as how we are in a similar situation to a previous case. Um, and I just wanted to note as somebody who is observing that this individual um, does not have a lawyer present, so they may not know that that is an option. Um, if someone else would like to expand on that and explain what that means, I think that would be helpful, um, just so that they have the full understanding of what's available to them. I think we're in the middle of a vote. I don't know that that's possible at this point. Thank you for the, a little late. We, it is it is a legal right though, so I, I would I would. We're we're in the, it's understood. Um, we're in the middle of a vote. The motion before us is to um, approve the special permit application FY twenty twenty five dash zero one. Is there a second? Second. Oh, uh, yes. First, we need a motion. I'm sorry. So, Yes, so, uh, Mr. the judge. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, we're, oh, we're, sorry. In the middle, sorry. We're, we're we're in the middle of a vote. It's, yeah. Okay. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? No discussion. The chair votes no. Mr. Meadows. No. Mr. Henry. Abstain. Mr. White? Abstain. Mr. Sloboder? No. The motion fails. Um, the, the special permit is denied. You have the ability to come back with a, um, a it's another application. 
at a later point in time. Um, but the application before us is denied at this point. Unfortunately, we didn't have a complete discussion, but I understand and thank you for your time. <laughs> Ms. Yao, you can, you can um, change your application, come back with some kind of a diff something different and we will, um, we will be able to see it. But I think you, I think you heard from the board, there's real concern about the location and the, uh, the the concept of the project at that location. And so I think you will want to um, think closely, work with the staff and see if there's a, some way you can fashion this so that it's uh, a little bit different application than we saw to, before us now. Uh, yeah, I understand now because we, I am new here, so I don't know the historical problem here in the community. So now I understand now. So the concern, I got the concern. So I just have one question. So because um um do I, do I have option to withdraw this application or not? No, this, not anymore. This, not you can't withdraw it now, but you can come back with another application. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. But it, I would tell you, don't come back with the same application. You'll see the same result, right? Yeah, I won't. It may I not even, I yeah, it may not even get to us at that point. Okay. I, I know the busy street, so I, yeah, I, I know now. Thank you. All right. Were there any other questions, comments from board members? If not, the next order of business is public comment on any matter not before us tonight. We have nobody from the public who wishes to speak. The next order of business is um, old business or, or business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. And I think that's just about schedule is all we really need, Ms. Brush, but can we run through the schedule? And may I make a comment? I think Ms. Yes. Williams is in a better position to go, Mr. go through the schedule. Before we do the schedule, do you have something? Well, I, I just want to say that I, I had asked for the attorney to come and explain things to us. And I, I appreciated his coming and, and uh, the town managers allowing him to come and explain. But I, I, as I said, I was more confused after we finished than I was before. Um, primarily because my sense is that the Commonwealth has got two conflicting um I, I, uh they're not regulations but they're um sponsorships uh and the, the 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 ability to have an attorney come and work with us on this uh i i think is essential Do we need to write a letter, Ms. Brestrup, as a as a board requesting this from Mr. Bachelman, or can, can why don't I try first? And yeah. maybe Mr. Mar has a different opinion, but I can try first. I've done that with um, comprehensive permits, and the town manager has agreed, um, so I can try and then see what he says. And if there's a problem, I can come back to you and get a letter. Does that right. make sense? Yep, that makes sense. Great. Okay, um, Ms. Williams, what do we have for the next two meetings? So next week we have Wayfinders um, on the 29th and that agenda has been published for anyone who is watching and is curious as to what we're gonna be discussing. Um, and I will be sending out links to that application packet as well as um, any additional things that we've received, but you should have actually already received a link to the application packet, but I'll send it out again if you don't have it. Um, on the 12th, it's just a regular meeting. Right now we have Shutesbury Road lined up. Um, we could have a potential application come forward for Canton Ave, but it might be too late for them. Um, I'll just double check that. And another application that could come forward if they get their ducks in a row is to um, just similar to what we saw with uh, Mr. Patel's application, simply just um, accepting or, you know, the existing management plan for 
uh, one of their properties that they just took over. But again, I need to get confirmation on that. So you could potentially have three cases or you could just have one, which is Shootsbury Road. Um, and the rest of the schedule is kind of the, the way we've been talking about it. Nothing else has come in or changed. Great. All right, thank you. Any other comments, questions? I would just say that we are following the fine tradition this week is that we're running long, <laughs> just like the Democratic Convention. I apologize to you all for that, but um, it's just the way it is sometimes. Um, there wasn't a Bill Clinton among us, but uh, <laughs> who spoke tw twice as a lot of time, but that's all right. All right, guys, thank you very much. We will see you all next week for uh, Wayfinders. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, thank you for the, especially to the staff. Who, Mr. Um, Chair, do we need not need to vote to adjourn? Yes, we do need to vote. To see, look, when I get off at past nine o'clock, you know, I'm ready to go, hour, but we need to do it right. <laughs> yeah, we, we need to do it right. <laughs> you know, it's past nine o'clock. I don't know what I'm doing. All right, thank you very much, Mr. White. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. All right, good. You're Just entitled. Second. Oh, I heard a second. second. There. Yep. Uh, this is a non-debatable motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. And Mr. Sloboder. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. We're adjourned. Thank you to the staff again for staying late and uh, even though you're working a full job during the day. Thank you so much. All right. Everyone Night. run away. <laughs>